Yes, sir. Okay. A very good evening. On behalf of Udupi branch of SIRC of ICA, as well as the Mysore branch of SIRC of ICA, I welcome you all for the today's virtual CPE meeting on GST annual returns and GST audit. And we are privileged to have with, having with us today CA Shankar Narayan sir from Chennai. Also, we are having with us today's chief guest, Dr. Tandale Kishore, Assistant Commissioner, Central, Central GST Udupi. And we are also having with us <coughs> CA Vasudev Rao sir, Chairman of Mysore branch of SRC of ICA. And we are also having with us Raghuveer CS, the Secretary Mysore branch and our beloved chairman with us, Udupi branch, CA Pradeep Jogi sir, I welcome you all. Now I request the Udupi branch chairman, CA Pradeep Jogi sir, to give the welcome address. Thank you, sir. Over to Pradeep, sir. Thank you, Lokit, sir. Good evening, everyone, and a warm welcome to the members and students to this uh, virtual CP meeting on GST annual return and uh, GST audit, that is nine, GSTR 9 and GSTR 9C. Organized by Mysore branch of SRCFIC and Udupi branch of SRCFIC. Every now and then, government keeps amending and updating the rules and procedures related to GST. We all know that uh, due date of GST annual return, uh, GSTR 9 and 9C, for the financial year 2018-19 is 30th September 2020. And most of us are uh, waiting for another extension. <laughs> there are many issues and uh, confusions among the professionals, so we thought it apt to have a session on GSTR 9 and 9C. We have with us a chief guest for today's program, Dr. Tandai Lekishur, IRS Assistant Commissioner of Central Tax Udupi. I wholeheartedly welcome you, sir, to this uh, virtual CP meeting. Thank it's you, a, thank you, sir. It's a great privilege for us to have uh, an eminent speaker, CA Shankar Narayan V from Chennai, who has uh, accepted our request and he's here to share his words of wisdom with us on this topic. Last year, we had uh, two sessions from him uh, in GSP certification course uh, at UDP. I heartily welcome you, sir, to this uh, virtual CP meeting. I have also with me CA Vasudev Rao, Chairman of uh, Mysore Branch, CA Raghuveer CS, Secretary of Mysore Branch, CA Kumar MG, Vice Chairman of uh, Mysore Branch, CA Lokesh Shetty, Secretary of Udupi Branch. I welcome, yes. sir. Once again, I welcome all the members and students to this uh, virtual CP meeting. For the information of the members, uh, it's unfortunate uh, that uh, we have lost a very much active and supportive CA Sharad Singhal, Secretary of uh, GST and Indirect Tax Committee. To COVID-19. I request you to pray for the eternal peace of the departed soul. Dear members, you can uh, post your questions and uh, uh, views in Q&A sections, which will be answered after the sessions. Thank you. Over to CA Lokesh City, sir. Thank you so much, uh, Pradeep, sir. <clears throat> now for the today's chief guest, uh, Tandale Kishore, sir, a small introduction. He completed his MBBS in Aurangabad, Maharashtra, and then he completed his IRS, then first posted to Mangalore as Assistant Commissioner of Central GST. Presently, he is Assistant Commissioner Central GST, Udupi. Now I request our Chief Guest for today, Sandali Kishore sir, to address the all the participants. Thank you, sir. Over to Kishore sir. Thank you, Lokesh Ji. I would like to thank you to uh, thank you, Lokesh Shetty, for a, a very nice introduction. I would like to thank uh, Sri Pradeep Jogi, um, uh, uh, Chairman of the uh, Udupi Branch of SIRC, for giving me this opportunity to uh, address the uh, CA uh, all CAs of the Udupi uh, district on the GSTR 9 and 9C. I would like to I, I would like to thank all other uh, participants and panelists, uh, especially the today's speaker C. A. Shankar Narayanan, whom I would I I would like to listen for the nine and nine C also in in course of time. But uh, as a chief guest, I would like to just introduce in a short way 
the 9 and 9c so exactly what is 9 and what is 9c just in 5 minutes i'll just give a brief broad overview of the 9 and 9c from the department's perspective only uh, and from assess's perspective and cs perspective uh, i think uh, our honorable speaker will be uh, doing the justice to uh, all the cs in next 3 hours so uh, in annual returns as per the section 44 of the one, 44 one of the cgst act it says ki uh, every taxpayer there are few exceptions every taxpayer should file his uh, 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 annual returns at the uh, on the 31 by the 31st december of the next uh, next 30 means suppose uh, 2018 19 is the financial year so by the uh, 31st december of the uh, coming final next year it should be filed but uh, time and again uh, government is uh, extending the timelines so for 2018-19 at uh, the same timeline has been extended from 31st december to 30th june 1st and uh, 30th june 2020 and it has been again extended to 30th uh, september 2020 again uh, uh, icai of delhi has given some presentations representations to the gst council and uh, they are expecting to uh further extension of the timelines so that is a policy matter but considering the 30 uh, 30th september as a uh, last date what should be the major focus uh, areas in the gstr 9 and 9c and what should be the uh, main uh, things which one should not skip so uh, the who should file the uh, annual uh, returns for 2018 and 19 the uh turnover limit of 2 crore for 2017-18 has been extended to 5 crores for 2018 and 19 so any taxpayer who is having a turnover of 5 crore should file is uh, 9 and 9c in that also some uh, uh, means uh, limits are given at 2 crores up to 2 crores nothing is binding 5 crores up to 5 crores only 9 is binding uh beyond 5 crores 9 and 9c means reconciliation is also mandatory so uh, in broad view what we can say is uh, uh, 9 is having uh, uh, overall 6 parts and 19 sections whereas 9c is having 5 parts and 16 tables we can say in which uh, what will be uh, being annual return it is just a compilation of the gstr 1 3b and 2a Uh, and 9a is for the composition dealers which we are not looking today so if uh, to file annual return properly one should be um, uh, well known with the gstr 1 gstr 2a and gstr 3b and uh, reconciliation of that and uh, uh, how cas are doing the reconciliation of that and giving the certification at the end of the part 2 of the uh, 9c so uh, as a ca or any uh, ca he should be well versed with gstr 1 gstr 2a gstr 3b invoices what is invoice debit note credit notes and uh, in addition to that he should be aware of of the uh, refund vouchers if in case it is uh, there so uh, exactly what is gstr 9 and what government has given facility in this gstr 9 for 2017 18 also uh, one column in part 2 is been given ki they can uh, means assesses can add their liabilities but they can't avail the uh, itc in 2018 19 annual returns also so considering this uh, uh, additional liability for the financial year 2017 18 uh, of um, which are de not declared in the gstr 1 and gstr 3b of 17 18 can be declared in this uh, year's financial Uh, means annual return of 2018 and 19 and but only one condition is there ki taxpayers can, cannot can, uh, cannot claim the itc available or which you, which was unclaimed during the 2017 and 18 so exactly what gstr 9 contains is part 1 contains its basic details part 2 contains outward supplies in outward supplies it is both tax uh, outward supplies on which tax is paid and on which tax is not paid Uh, that uh, part 2 uh, uh, contains that then part 3 contains itc claimed or reversed in that uh, itc claimed or reversed uh, uh, the details of the uh, of gstr 3b like uh, column 4a will be auto populated 
on one side and it will be compared with uh, it will be compared with the uh, inward supplies and uh, services received from SEZs as well as uh, ITC avail reversed and reclaimed. If the comparison of both 3B and this uh, ITC uh, inward supplies on uh, ITC on inward supplies and services received from SEZ and ITC avail avail reversed and claimed. If it is equal, then there is no issue of uh, means either excess uh, ITC availment or uh, 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 less availment of ITC. If this value is going to be a positive, then it says that there is excess availment. So department will be looking at these points only, whether there is excess availment, excess of availment from the ICC, or uh, whatever ITC available was to the ICC was not taken properly. Then uh, part four uh, is about the, in this part three, ITC claimed and reversed, there are table seven and table eight. Table seven talks about the reversals of the ITC as per the rule 37, 39, 42, 43 and section 17, 5. And table eight talks about the auto population of the ITC and whether, um, uh, means uh, uh, whether auto populated ITC, uh, which was available in 2A and uh, taken in 3B. Its relation with the uh, table 6B and 6H of the uh, uh, table 6 of uh, uh, annual returns and ITC uh, ITC available but not available for imports. So this comparison will be done in table 8. And uh, then next part is tax paid or adjusted. In this case of tax paid or adjusted, uh, what will be looked at is okay, what is the tax payable by the ICC and how much tax is actually paid by the ICC. But uh, one thing can be noted is that ICC cannot pay any tax liability if uh, additional tax liability is there through the annual returns. He has to pay it through the DRC 03. So uh, this is the part four. And part five is related to the previous year transaction reported, means in table 10 to 13. Uh, transactions related to the 2017-18, uh, whose additional liability ICC is filling key, he has to declare in the annual returns. But the only thing is key, the date uh, that should be taken is 1st May 2020. 1st May 2000. Just a minute. Means uh, whatever is the uh, your previous transactions in that case, if you are taking some issues related to ITC and 2A, then the date should be of 1st May of 2000. Uh, I'm just getting a little confused. First May 2019 means in case of table 8 of the ITC, uh, to population of the ITC. Otherwise, what will happen now? Whatever ITC is available to the ICC, if they are taking the till the date of 30th of the September 2020, then uh, it will be the excess of the ITC availed on part of the ICC and it will be wrong, uh, wrongly showed in the uh, uh, annual returns. Then uh, when we come to the uh, uh, Six part, six part which shows about, which talks about the additional uh, means other details. In that order, other details, uh, uh, it it has uh, it is talking about the uh, financial year 2017-18 transactions in which uh, we have to uh, ICC has to declare about the supplies plus debit notes uh, as any supplies reduced plus credit notes. Reversal of ITCs, ITC available for the previous financial year, and differential tax paid on account of declarations in table 10 and 11. So this uh, other information is also has to be filed in the uh, annual returns. Whereas in case of 9C, which is a reconciliation statement between the books of account of the taxpayer and the GSTR 9, it is a um, uh, responsibility of the CS as per the section 35 5. Beyond a certain limit, uh, if ICC has a turnover, which will be decided by the uh, government, uh, in case of this now 2, uh, two crore and 5 crore has been decided for 2017, 18, and 18, 19. So audited financial statements uh, has to be submitted by the ICCs 
like balance sheet, profit on loss account, cash flow statement, and other statements, uh, along with the reconciliation statement. In this reconciliation statement, uh, uh, CS will be reconciling the uh, means whatever is the financial statements as well as uh, 9C, and he uh, CS will be commenting on that. He uh, whether reconciliation is proper or not, and that uh, that might lead to some conflicts between the uh, department and CS. He as CS, CS have given this uh, reconciliation is correct or this reconciliation is not correct. Means some responsibility or some onus will be uh, on the CS henceforth for the whatever audited audited uh, financial statements they are giving to the department. Yeah, by keeping this into consideration, CS, CA association and CS has to be very much uh, truthful to the, or uh, I can say ki, uh, very much open-minded to the assesses regarding their declarations to the department. Uh, and, uh, then this uh, reconciliation statement also has five parts in which part one is basic details, part two is reconciliation of turnover, part three is reconciliation of taxes paid, Part four is reconciliation of ITC input tax credit, and part five is additional liability arising due to the non-reconciliation. So many tables are 15 tables, 16 tables are there, and uh, in each table, um, uh, reconciliation of everything means uh, like uh, nine uh, annual return nine and uh, assesses financial uh, annual statements will be done by the CS, whoever is uh, means uh, um, uh, doing the reconciliation in part two, and he will be giving his. Uh, comments also on that. So uh, taking into consideration, uh, means all these facts, uh, uh, nine and nine C, uh, it is very much important to file all annual returns and uh, reconciliation statements within due time. Otherwise, uh, there will be late fee and uh, penalty. If uh, uh, late fee will be um, 100 rupees for CGST and 100 rupees for the SGST, uh, up to 0.5 percent of the turnover of the uh, SSC means it can be minimum of both. Uh, if uh, uh, 200 rupees per day uh, for particular number of days is less than the 0.5 percent of the turnover of the SSC, then that will be applicable. And if there is a uh, if department found ki there is some um, uh, means it is uh, uh, specifically hidden or not uh, uh, filed, then a penalty up to 50,000 can be also be. Uh, paid by uh, means has to be applied from the department side to the assessee. So keeping into this consideration, uh, uh, I would request all CAs and assessees to uh, uh, file all annual returns within time. And if any queries are there, um, CAs within UDPR, I am accessible on phone as well as uh, uh, everyone is uh, uh, welcome to the uh, offices also without any prior uh, appointment or anything. I would like to thank all uh, CA association members, uh, especially CA uh, the, uh, Pradeep Jogi chairman, uh, and the new chairman, and Sri uh, Lokesh Shetty secretary to, uh, for giving this opportunity. I think I have given very broad and very uh, superficial uh, 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 superficial introduction to the 9 and 9C. I think that, that is not sufficient. Uh, Sri uh, Shankar Narayanan will be doing the uh, justice to the whatever I have just given in a very fast and speedy way. Uh, sometimes I have, uh, means uh, in one or two cases I might be wrong or where there is need of improvement also. Uh, Sri Shankar Narayanan can correct me also in that case. Thank you so much for uh, giving me this opportunity. Thank you, sir. Thank you, Kishore, sir, for the wonderful brief introduction on uh, 9 and 9C. Now I request the Mysore branch uh, chairman, CA Vasudev Rao sir, to introduce the today's uh, resource person. Over to Vasudev sir. Thank you sir, Lokesh. I'm audible sir. Yes sir. Yes sir, kindly proceed. Yeah. Thank you for giving me the opportunity of introducing the speaker of the day, CA Shankar Narayanan V. He's become ACMA and FCA. To summarize the credentials, he is a chartered accountant and cost and management accountant with one and a half decade of experience in financial and taxation compliances, planning across, uh, spanning across uh, diverse sectors, including banks, service sector, and manufacturing sectors, with specialization in indirect taxes, that is GST, customs, foreign trade policy. And uh, his association with many other bodies are as follows. He is a member of the GST study group of ICAI, 
He is a master trainer of GST affiliated by Institute of Chartered Accountants of India. He is a contributor as part of the ICI team in charge of preparing and updating background material on GST. He has trained more than 2,000 chartered accountants and 6,000 plus finance and accounts professionals across India on GST law and practice and indirect taxes. He is a member of governing council of secretary of International Chamber of Indirect Tax Professionals. He is a member of Indirect Taxes Committee of Hindustan Chamber of Commerce. He has authored books on SENVAT and GST. He is a speaker and trainer on taxation at many institutes, which include the following Institute of Chartered Accountants of India, Institute of Cost Accountants of India, Institute of Company Secretaries of India, Commercial Tax Staff Training Institute, Tamil Nadu, National Academy for Customs Indirect Taxes and Narcotics, Chennai, Regional Training Institute of CAG. He is also an ICP engaged in GST knowledge dissemination part of Niti Aayog initiative. He is the founder partner in GPVS and Associates, a chartered a Chennai based CA firm heading the indirect taxation, compliances, advisory, and litigations vertical. With this brief introduction, let me welcome the speaker of the day, Sri Shankar Narayanan. Now it is over to you, sir, to take the session. Thank you. Thank you, sir. Thank you. The uh, chairman of Mysore branch, CA Vasudev Rao, uh, the chairman of Udupi branch, uh, Pradeep Jogi, the other office bearers of uh, both the branches of Udupi and Mysore, and the chief guest for the day, Dr. Kishore Tandale. GSTR 9 and 9C, this has been the buzzword. Uh, uh, in everybody's uh, thought, especially I would say in, in chartered accountants' mind, in the last 15 days, it has gained momentum. And the sheer fact that uh, we have scheduled a session on GST audit on 26th of uh, September, for 30th September due date, goes to show the confidence that we have that there will be an extension. I'll tell you, you, if you are thinking that you are confident and uh, we still have more confident people. Kannur branch has asked me to do a session on 30th September itself. Then I told them, sir, 30th September, 6.30 to 8.30, really you want me to do a session? They said, yes, please do, because there will be an extension, certainly. So whether we inspire that or not, we are ready to accept that there will be an extension. So that is something which, as a sigh of relief, I would start off with by saying that, uh, one, don't worry, and I think uh, the uh, I mean, the chief guest for the day, Mr. Kishore, has also said, what is the quantum of late fees? So the late fees is not something which is uh, draconian. So even if it is going to be a situation of payment of late fees, it is only going to be 200 rupees per day, whichever is of lower. So it is 0.25% or 200 rupees per day. And the invocation of penalty under section 125 can happen only if they give a notice. Before that, we should be able to file. So don't take too much of pressure. Uh, the last thing that we should be worried about is uh, the due date. Then what is it that we are supposed to do? within this uh, time or what are the key areas? I'm not going to uh, go the uh, table route and tell this table, this has to be populated. That is not going to be the uh, agenda for today. What we are going to discuss is broader areas where we have to be careful in terms of certification because we have a test responsibility there. So that is something which I'm going to harp on and plus uh, like a checklist, a few areas where we have to be covering ourselves. So that is what is going to be my uh, coverage today. With that in perspective, I'll start sharing the screen. Give me a few minutes, a couple of moments. I'll be able to share, I believe. Yes. So now uh, you are able to see my presentation. I think, yes, you are sharing Microsoft PowerPoint. It is, that is what it is saying. So it is there. Now, when it comes to audit under GST, at the outset, I wanted to clarify this point because there have been enough clarifications or uh, the presence of excessive knowledge is also a problem because we see that in Google, whenever we search, it will give you some answer and everybody thinks that that is the answer, that is the correct answer. So hence, I wanted to uh, bring out something from the basis. Section 2, subsection 13 of the CGST Act is the one which talks about what is an audit. An audit two parts are involved. One is an examination, the other one is a verification. So what it says is an audit is an examination, examination of what? Examination of the records, 
returns and other documents which they are supposed to maintain. The registered person is supposed to maintain either under this act or rules made under this act or any other law for the time being in force. Now, two parts are there. One, a person who is getting audited under GST only. Situation number one. Situation number two, a person who is also getting audited under the Companies Act, also getting audited under the Income Tax Act, is also getting audited under GST. So this is situation two. So there is another audit for the person already. That is GST audit. One category. Audit is only under GST is second category. Sir, how can audit under GST alone happen without tax audit? Obviously, when tax audit comes, that is when people will get audited under GST. If that is the notion, if any of us are having, I believe that is wrong. Because if I am a person who is having a commercial rental, I am having a shopping complex, I am letting the whole complex on rental, per month rent is around 50 lakhs for me. Per month rental is 50 lakhs for me, then an yearly rental would mean 6 crores. This 6 crores, for income tax purpose, I will be showing it under the income from house property under section 22. It will not be under PGPP, profit or gains of business or profession. Now, this person is not liable for tax audit under income tax, but this person is liable for audit under GST. So there is a high possibility that a person can become liable to be audited under GST alone. That 5 crore that we are looking at, which I'll explain when we come to that 5 crore discussion also, hence, it is not mandatory that whoever is having tax audit will have GST audit, agree. But whoever is not having tax audit will not have GST audit is something which I am not ready to accept for the example that I have given to you. So when we are doing that audit, we are supposed to do an examination. Now there have been uh, instances in the past where people have said, uh, section 2 subsection 13 Shankar is talking about audit. Now audit is something which is mentioned under section 65 of the CGST Act. Whether it is section 65 of the CGST Act or section 35 subsection 5 of the CGST Act, for me, both are talking about audit. Section 65 talks about the audit by the department, whereas section 35 subsection 5 talks about audit by a chartered accountant or a cost accountant who is in practice. So for me, audit is a common definition for both. Hence, this is also a definition that we are supposed to take it into consideration while doing our GST audit. So we are supposed to examine the records, returns, and other documents. If the audit is only happening under GST, it is mandatory. If the audit is happening under any other law, then we can borrow the audit under that law and give it. How that happens, I'll tell you a little later. So first part, audit involves examination. The next part is audit involves verification. So the second part of audit defined under GST. To verify what? To verify the correctness of the turnover, tax paid, refund claim, and ITC. If you see, this is what is the focus area of 9C also. Except refund claimed, all the other three reconciliations we are giving in 9C. Turnover declared, table 5 and uh, 6, in the span up to 9 to prove the tax paid. And uh, 12 is where we are discussing about the uh, input tax credit, 12, 13, 14. Refund is the only thing which is not there in 9C. But we are supposed to verify the correctness of all the four. That is why a refund is made as a field or a table in GSTR 9. But GSTR 9, that table has been given as an optional table for financial year 2017-18 and 18-19 filing. Hence, we may prefer to skip it. But as an auditor, am I supposed to do that? If you ask me that question, yes. We are supposed to verify the correctness of these four. Turnover, tax paid, ITC and refund claim. And then to assess the compliance, what is the level of compliance of this person? With the provisions of the act or the rules made there under. So I am talking about the examination of the records. So I, have, I am supposed to tell, me, I am meaning the person who is doing the audit, is supposed to tell to the department what all I have verified and whether it is in compliance with the expectation of the GST law. This is also something that I am supposed to tell. So two parts to the definition of audit which we should be mindful of. Now that is in perspective when we go to section 35 subsection 5. What it says is that an audit when is it becoming mandatory? Turnover in a financial year exceeds the prescribed limit. The limit is prescribed under Rule 80 sub Rule 3. Shall get his accounts audited by a chartered accountant or a cost accountant. And shall submit an audited annual accounts and reconciliation statement. The reason I have highlighted the word and is because people are thinking that reconciliation statement is the only deliverable for an auditor for GST audit. It is not so. We are supposed to conduct an audit 
and submit a reconciliation statement. It is not audit of reconciliation statement. The reconciliation statement is an outcome, is one of the outcomes of our audit. Reconciliation statement is not the only outcome of the audit. We are supposed to do an audit and based upon that audit, we are supposed to verify and clarify whether the reconciliation statement given is correct or not, or what is the impact of the difference which is arising in the reconciliation statement. Is it resulting in additional tax liability to the SSE? If yes, whether he has paid it or not, that is what we are supposed to tell. So reconciliation statement is not the only deliverable. It is one of the deliverables which we are submitting, but we are assuming responsibility much more than a reconciliation statement. That is what section 35 subsection 5 is vesting on us as a responsibility. Now moving to the next part, the GST audit under section 35 subsection 5, this is how I look at it. Examination and verification is one part and then the reconciliation statement is other part. So if I do the examination verification, reconciliation, then what I have done is an audit under GST. Now if I do only reconciliation statement, it is never considered to be an audit under GST. I am supposed to do examination and verification and the reconciliation statement, then only it is considered as an audit in the GST. Sheer reconciliation statement is not an audit. Now, to explain it further, if I am going to be the statutory auditor and I am the person who is doing the GST audit also, I have got twofold responsibilities. I am the statutory auditor and I am also the GST auditor. Assuming uh, the client, the taxpayer is subject to audit under any other law also. Maybe income tax, maybe company SAC, maybe even society or cooperative society. So for that also I am the auditor and for GST also I am the auditor. This is the situation. What you are doing is examination and verification. You are doing it as part of the statutory audit. And then what you are doing is a reconciliation statement only for the purpose of GST. Because you are already assuming the responsibility of examination and verification under your role as a statutory auditor. So what you are doing as an outcome is only for the reconciliation statement because you have done the examination verification so it is not dispensed with if you are a G, if you are doing a gst audit since you have already done it you are doing only the reconciliation statement suppose if you are the statutory auditor and you are not the gst audit other way uh, look at it other way around from a gst audit pers audit perspective you are the gst auditor but you are not the statutory auditor then what happens if you are the gst auditor and not the statutory auditor then in that case Examination verification part would have been done by the statutory auditor. In GSTR 9C, there is a specific provision to tell that whether we have done the audit and we are certifying or whether somebody else has done the audit. We are saying that it is somebody else who has done the audit if we are only the GST auditor. And then we give a reconciliation statement. Is it enough? The answer is no. Because if you are only a GST auditor, not a statutory auditor, still you are supposed to perform a certain amount of examination and verification. So this is something which we have to be aware of, which is what uh, the reason for the presentation today, because if you are a statutory auditor as well as a GST auditor, the points that we are going to discuss will throw some light in terms of whether we have done this or not. The second part is if you are not the statutory auditor, but you are landing up as a GST auditor, what are all the things that we have to look there to get an answer as to whether these are right in the perspective of GST. So that is also something which I have taken into consideration. So when we dissect the provisions of section 35 of section 5 read by 2 subsection 13 of CGST Act, this is what emerges as the scope which is expected out of us as chartered accountants who are going to be GST auditors for any organization. So now, based upon this scope, we are going to look at what is the expectation in terms of numbers. And at the outset, we will exclude those people who are not getting into the purview of GST audit being uh, the Department of Central Government or State Government or any local authority. Now, they are all liable to get registered and they are not, uh, they are all liable to file returns, pay tax. That is a different thing, but they are not subjected to GST audit. And anybody whose books of accounts are subjected to audit by Comptroller and Audit General of India, the C and AG, under them they are getting attracted. Then these Department of Government, which is the State Government or the Central Government or the local authority, need not worry about getting audit under GST. So section 35 of section 5 gives them an exception. And as it is, the GST are nine not required people. That is an input service distributor, a person who is registered only for complying TDS and TCS provision. Now these people need not worry about GST are nine. When GST are nine itself is not there, that is annual return under section 44 itself is not there. Then they need not worry about filing the GST 
audit report also. So there are two kinds of exclusions. One GST audit is excluded, but annual return is compulsory. For these people whom we are seeing on the screen, GSTR 9 is there, but GSTR 9C is not there. The audit under GST is not there. But whereas the other parties, that is an input service distributor or a person who is registered only as a TDS TCS, uh, charging person, meaning TDS TCS complying person, or a person who is registered as a casual taxable person. Now, these are the people for whom GSTR 9 is not there. Consequently, 9 is, 9C is not there. So for them, 9C is not an exclusion because 9C alone is not excluded. For them, 9 itself is not there. Hence, 9C is irrelevant. For these people, 9 is there, but 9C is irrelevant. Moving further, audit by a chartered accountant for the purpose of 2018-19 financial year only. I repeat, it is only for financial year 18-19 because this amendment is specifically made as a proviso to Rule 80 sub Rule 3 by adding the words for FY 2018-19 only, the limit is fixed as 5 crores. So if you look at 2017-18 financial year, it was 2 crores. The limit for getting audited. If you cross that limit, you are supposed to get audited. And if you cross the limit of 5 crores only, you are supposed to get audited in 2018-19. But as the law stands today, if you ask me for 19-20, what is the limit? I will say 2 crores. Because this limit of 5 crores enhancement has happened only for financial year 1819. It has not happened for any after years. It has been specifically mentioned in Rule 80 sub Rule 3 only for 1819. We'll have to wait and see whether it changes for 1920. Okay. Now, what is this 5 crore turnover as such? The 5 crore turnover as such is an aggregate turnover. Aggregate turnover across India, pan India basis. The word pan has double meaning here across India as well as pan based turnover. That is what we are supposed to take, which includes all your taxable supplies, export of goods and services, exempted supplies, everything will come as part of the supplies to arrive at whether you have exceeded 5 crores. Sir, my total turnover itself is 6 crores. In Tamil Nadu, I have done 3 crores. In Karnataka, I have done 3 crores. Should I get audited? Yes, because your aggregate turnover has got exceeded 6 crores. It doesn't matter whether you are getting 3 only in this state. Aggregate has exceeded 5 crores. GST audit becomes mandatory in both the registrations. GSTR 9C has to be submitted for both the registrations. Now, what is the reason for this? This is where I think from a department perspective also, it will be very important and useful. From a, let's do a law perspective. In central excess, there was no concept of annual return. In service tax, there, were, there was no concept of annual return, which in fact, in 2016, they tried. They even brought in a uh, rule. They made an amendment, they brought in a rule. The rule was not notified at all. Because by the time they realized that 2017, we are going to hit GST, so they didn't make it functional. So they were attempting to have an annual return kind of procedure and excise and service tax. But in VAT, we are all used to it. Whether it is in Karnataka, I think VAT 100 or VAT 240, I'm not able to recollect the annual returns name. One of it is monthly return, one of it is annual return, that much I remember. And then uh, the, in Tamil Nadu, we used to have Form WW, likewise we used to have in every state a VAT annual return. So people who have dealt with VAT are already conversant with the need of an annual return. Now, here to clarify, in GST scenario, the annual return assumes much, much more relevance and importance for the simple reason how we used to do annual return in VAT is what I want to take up as an initial discussion. If you look at VAT when we are doing the uh, VAT uh, filing, annual return, what we will do, step one, we will take the PNL or balance sheet. We will take the PNL. This is the total sales. And in that sales, we will identify what is pertaining to this state. And we will say that this is pertaining to this state. All the remaining turnover, though the company is present, say, in five states in India, we will not segregate between states. We will simply say, this is Karnataka turnover, others. In PNL, there will be a vertical split. PNL will be split into two parts Karnataka, others. That's it. That others. Neither the officer will be bothered, nor we will be bothered, because we know that that others is something which could be others' problem. It is not Karnataka state's problem. So that is how we used to complete the audits. We'll say this is Karnataka turnover, this is others. But GST, this has become impossible for the simple reason that turnover across India is measured with the same legal provisions. And the data that is being uploaded is being uploaded in the same portal. So there cannot be an others. 
if we are saying this is karnataka's turnover then the other states turnover shall also be forming part of sir where is it mentioned is it there legally mentioned somewhere no but if you are saying this is the turnover for this state then you prove it but the officer has got every right to ask now you have said others please prove to me what is this others if he asks a vertical split uh, we have to give the vertical split of how much is for tamil nadu kerala karnataka andhra pradesh telangana we have to give the whole distribution why we have to give because only when we give that when it is summed up the total should match with the pnl if the total of all these states is not matching with the pnl that you have given you are in trouble no no there is a total there is a difference but i can explain the difference that is what is your reconciliation statement which is what they are expecting now i'll tell you the simple reason why it has been done like this or in the past has there been anything that is uh, alarming in the situation yes in one of the meetings of inter taxes committee a senior member had shared in the vat regime this has happened in maharashtra vat they were accepting that okay this is maharashtra turnover uh, rest of it is other states but suddenly they decided to do a in depth analysis of this person who is disclosing that turnover when they did the in depth analysis they found that they have done the transactions of worth 600 crores within maharashtra but which has been reported as others which has never come as part of their turnover they have never disclosed it in a intelligent uh, action it was brought out and that is when he said see this kind of thing cannot happen in gst because in gst naturally we are supposed to tell that what is for this state and in that state somebody should say what is for that state so even if you are not giving the data the officer will be easily able to get the data and sum it up and see whether everything is matching if it is not matching we are duty bound to do the reconciliation that is why this combined turnover forms very 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 important part so it is not individually one state exceeding 5 crores it is aggregate turnover of 5 crores we are supposed to do the reconciliation and if you are auditing only for karnataka get the numbers for karnataka and submit the audit report likewise everybody should do it for respective states somebody in the company the organization should verify that every state individually together sums up to the overall total we will discuss more about this when we come to the discussion of multi state presence organizations now gst and wise trial balance is it mandatory yes because section 35 regulation section 36 and rule 56 very clearly says that books of accounts shall be maintained for every registration in fact for every place of business within that registration but books of accounts shall be maintained for every registration separately which means if you are maintaining books of accounts for every registration every registration registration is based upon a trial balance for that registration only if it is there we should be able to match it with books or we should be able to call it as books and match it with the gst returns if it is not there with what we will match matching will become a futile exercise so insisting on a gst in wise trial balance is one of the first steps in doing the gst audit and then identification of the gst ledgers the trial balance would contain multiple ledgers we have to identify what are all the ledgers which are pertaining to gst for example the input tax credit ledgers the output tax liability ledgers the cash ledgers we have to identify those and then we have to do the reconciliation that is the second part and then comes the most important thing the reconciliation as um, we have already aware in gst r9 the major challenge that we have always been having i i would say always been having because for 2017 18 19 19 maybe in 1920 Uh, this problem would have reduced but for 17 18 and 18 19 we have had enough in this area only as a trouble the trouble is we are supposed to match four data gstr 3b gstr 1 and then i should match it with books of accounts and then the itc should be matched with 2a four individual reconciliations leave 2a for a moment now we have three reconciliations to do or three numbers which i have to reconcile gstr 1 gstr 3b vis a vis gst books all the three will have to be reconciled now in this effort what am i supposed to do nine will get auto populated with gstr1 numbers and unfortunately gstr1 during 1819 wouldn't have matched with our 3b so can i take 3b as the right number no because 3b is not matching with my books of accounts now i am stuck one is in one direction 3b is in another direction and my books is in another direction what should i do 
two press releases come to our relief. June 4th, 2019, July 3rd, 2019, two press releases were given by the department specifically on GSTR 9 and 9C. These two press releases made it amply clear that we need not have to give what is there in 1, what is there in 3B. No, what they have said is what is right, you please give that there. What is right meaning as per the books of accounts, what is the amount on which the tax should have been paid? What is the amount on which the tax should have been paid? Please give it there. Sir, but when it comes to ITC, what should I do? In, when it comes to ITC, whatever you have availed in 3B only should be explained there. So there you cannot take additional ITC based upon GSTR 9. So GSTR 9 is not an ITC availing return. ITC availment still has to be done in GSTR 3B. But 2A matching in GSTR 3B, am I supposed to do the table 8? The table 8 of GSTR 9, where we are supposed to do a 2A matching. Again, there are split opinions. Again, I'll clarify one part here, which is this table 8, the department has already come out in November 2019 as a relief measure for 2017, 18 and 18, 19, that it need not be filled up in GSTR 9. The SSA has been given an option to give that reconciliation in GSTR 9C while uploading the documents without certification by the auditor as a upload. In a plain sheet of paper, we can do the reconciliation upload. Now, there are two ways of looking at it. One, 2A reconciliation seems to be mandatory. How? They have just said that you need not do it in 9. You have an option to do it in 9C. It means if I do not do it in 9, I have to do it in 9C. If I do not have a liability to file 9C or if I do not file it in 9C, it means that I have to do it in 9. So either way, I become responsible to do this 2A reconciliation is one school of thought. Whereas others are saying, no, no. You want you give, else you can skip giving the 2A reconciliation because 2A reconciliation is not mandatory up to 9th of October 2019. The insertion of rule 36 sub rule 4 saying that it has to match, then only you can avail credit and you can avail excess of only up to 20% and then from January 2020 reduced to 10%. All this happened only from 9th October 2019, which will not bind us for 17, 18 and 18, 19 is another school of thought. Clearly, you have to draw the line how we are going to go about it. So, 2A reconciliation, is it there or not? We have to subscribe to one school of thought out of these two. I have subscribed to the thought that 2A reconciliation is not mandatory for 18 because even if I find a difference now, my client cannot go and get it changed by his supplier. Hence, if I am in possession of a document, we are going ahead and saying, yes, you are eligible. Because 2A itself was introduced sometime in September 2018 only. Till the time, it was not even there. Hence, correcting of 1718, correcting of 1819 on an ongoing basis will all become a question mark. So, this is the first part that we, do, we have to be clear. Which is the one which you are going to report? Is it going to be as per books? Is it going to be as per 3B? Is it going to be as per GSTR 1? The answer is what is right has to be reported. And what is right is obviously the books which has got audited for some other purpose. No, no, I have not got audited under any other purpose. I am getting only under GST. Then in that case, you have the right of getting audited in the GST and then that numbers have to be reported here. Going to the next part, the other areas where we need to be a little cautious and uh, look at the uh, way the SSE has done the tax liability. One is the HSN classification. Sir, is it mandatory for us to check the HSN classification of the SSE? In some of the cases where there is an ambiguity, where the SSE might have paid, for example, uh, where it is taxable at 12%, the SSE might have taken it at 5%. One of the major uh, fighting areas, especially in Karnataka Authority for Advanced Ruling, has been this oil. Oil for uh, the lamp, a lamp oil. Lamp oil, whether it is 5% or 12%, whether it is edible, inedible, all these questions are running. So we are not sure. Uh, same way, flavored milk. Flavored milk, is it an energy drink or is it a milk product? All these kind of questions are there. Now, should I sit and do verification of it? You need not, but at least, which is the major HSN that We may have to highlight it in our audit process. One and says which the SSE is dealing. If there is a rate change during the year 2018-19, 
there have been minimal changes, but there have been changes. Till July 2018, we did have some rate changes. So please check whether that rate change has been properly incorporated and adopted by the SSE. Especially on the date of change, just before the date of change and just after the date of changes, whether the numbers are properly reported, because there is a tendency that once you know from today the rate is going to be lesser, previous invoices might be cancelled, new invoices might be issued in place of what has gone already. So these kind of things shouldn't have happened. So rate revision around that, what is the GST liability or problem that has happened, we can do a test check. And then in case of services, a very, very important key area, especially for 2018-19, the reason being, in the notification 8 bar 2017 IGST, which talks about the 8 bar 2017, which talks about the rate in case of services. What is the rate at which the services will have to be taxed? The corresponding notification in CGST is 11 bar 2017. That notification says, if you have given the right to use to another person, in case of renting, it talks about this. In case of renting, leasing or hiring, if you have given the right to use to the other person, then what happens? If you have given the right to use to the other person, then the rate at which the renting is taxable is the rate at which the goods are taxable. I'll repeat, if you have given the right to use to the other person, the rate at which the renting is taxable is the rate at which the goods are taxable. That is what has been told as the rate to be adopted. Now. Coming back to that, in 2019, there was a monumental change which happened from 1st of January 2019. What they did is any kind of renting, leasing, hiring, they made the rate of taxability as the rate at which the goods are taxable. So the need for shifting the right to use, then only it is becoming taxable at the rate at which the goods are taxable is no more relevant. How does it impact us? I'll tell you. If I am giving my vehicle on hire, I am in the business of running the vehicle on hire. So I am giving it on hire. I have not given the right to use to the person. Then, till 31st of December 2018, I could have charged the maximum of 18%. Maybe depending upon the ITC availment or non-availment, 5 or 12%, I could have taken. But from 1st January 2019, whether I give the right to use to him or not, if I have given the vehicle on rent, the taxability is at the rate at which the vehicle is taxable. So look at the rate at which the vehicle is taxable. The vehicle is taxable at the 28%. So I have to charge 28%. That's it. I have to directly charge 28% to the renting also. This is what is an important change which has happened from 1st of January 2019, especially for renting services. Renting, hiring, leasing, please go through that. So for services, this check may be done. Moving further, unbuilt revenue. Unbuilt revenue uh, is a transaction which can happen, especially in case of some service industries, especially infrastructure industries, construction, those kind of industries, where the revenue would have been recognized for the purpose of PNL, but to that extent, GST invoice would not have been raised. Is it an illegal activity to, raise, uh, to recognize revenue in PNL and not show it in GST? Absolutely not. Only when the time of supply occurs, we are supposed to pay GST under the GST law. So coming under services, section 13 of the CGST Act talks about the time of supply. So if we are not attracting time of supply, but we are booking revenue, we are well within the law to do that. But that we have to identify because there is a possibility of difference between the turnover in P&L vis-a-vis the turnover in GST because of this only. You would have realized something as your turnover in the books only, but you wouldn't have shown it in the GST return. Maybe you would have done it in the next month. April 5th, you might have raised the invoice and you would have paid the GST in the month of May. But the income would have been recognized on 31st March. Hence, the unbuilt revenue is something which we will have to take note of from two perspectives. One from the opening balance perspective as well as the closing balance perspective where these two, the net off will only be an impact in the current year PNL because opening balance will increase the revenue. Closing balance, rather opening balance will reduce the revenue. Closing balance will increase the revenue. That has to be taken care of. And then deferred revenue where we are postponing the uh, revenue recognition, which is unique only to, again, the accountants. Uh, earlier, I used to think this can happen only for service industry. Now, I think it is happening uh, even for goods industry. For example, a huge manufacturer 
what uh, he has done is on 31st march their marketing team was working overtime only to print bills all the dispatches were happening only from 1st of april so out of the bills that were printed let's say 200 bills were printed on 31st march they managed to send outside the factory out of the 200 bills only 100 during april the remaining 100 went only in may so the statutory auditor has simply said that though you have raised the invoices on 31st of march I will not allow you to recognize revenue for all the 200 invoices. Maybe 50 invoices you can recognize as revenue in March. The remaining 50, please postpone the revenue to next year, deferred revenue. But look at the GST impact. In GST, these invoices would have been reported on 31st of March itself, which means the time of supply occurs when you raise the invoice, section 31, subsection 1, read with section 12. The time of supply has arised. So, based upon time of supply, the GST would and should have been paid for the month of March, but that will not be reflecting in turnover. So, this could be a reason for the difference. The earlier situation that we saw is PL comes first, GST comes later. Now, this situation is GST comes first, PL comes later. Here also, we can have the same kind of deferred revenue concept for both opening as well as closing. The net will only impact the current year. Please make note of that. That can be a reconciliation item. The other key item could be the advances. It is not much of a problem for 1819 because the whole of the year 1819, one uh, relief is that only for services, advances we need to pay GST, not for goods. So that problem was not there in 1819. So for goods related advances, we don't have to pay any GST. But for service related advances, we are liable to pay GST. That part we have to check whether we have received any advance during the year on which GST has been paid. Because if advance is received and GST has been paid on that, in GST books, that will be shown as how to a taxable supply. Because that advance is a taxable supply. We are, that is how we are supposed to show it in 3B. But look at it from a P&L perspective. To the extent of that advance, there won't be any turnover in P&L because it is only a turnover. No? Rather, it is not a turnover. No? Only when I invoice, it becomes a turnover. Till the time, it is only an advance on which invoice has not been raised and adjusted. Hence, it will remain as an advance in my balance sheet. It will not come to my P&L. This one, from a GST perspective, should be identified and tax liability has to be checked. Second, from a reconciliation perspective, will form part of your tax liability calculation, but will not form part of your P and L turnover. The other one, the even more critical area, which the department can ask us in future the questions is, the transaction that is happening between the distinct persons, the related persons are distinct persons. When we do the transactions, that is where we will have questions. The classic example being stock transfer. Stock transfer between one part of the entity to other part of the entity where both of you have a separate registration. It is immaterial if you are having a single registration and within that state you are doing n number of turnover, there is no problem. Because nothing of the turnover needs to be reported in GST. But what can happen is one state to another state I am doing a stock transfer. I will become a person who has done a transaction with a related person or a distinct person. In that situation, how to do one, the valuation, how it has been accounted in the books, how the reconciliation shall have to be done, whether the elimination has happened properly in the books. I will give a practical example that I have seen which will answer all these questions. What I have seen is where I, for a company I am only a GST auditor. What I saw was tackling. What they have done, especially during 1819, which is interesting is, Within the state stock transfer, within the state same registration stock transfer, they have raised invoices. And all the invoices that they have raised for within the state stock transfer, they have reported it as exempt turnover. One, it is not exempt turnover because it is not a supply at all for the purpose of GST. It doesn't get covered under section 7 at all. But they have taken a wrong position, but they have not paid a wrong tax, but they have reported it as exempt turnover. And what they have not done is whatever they have done as a supply to the other state, their own companies branch in the other state, they have done transactions. But unfortunately, the statutory auditor has considered those invoices as also part of the turnover. He has not considered the within the state turnover, but he has considered the outside the state also as part of the turnover for income tax purpose. So when I did the GST audit, I took all the within the entity invoices, that is from Chennai to Bangalore, Bangalore to Maharashtra. I have taken all those invoices and respectively state-wise, I am reporting it as uh, distinct person transaction, deemed supply under Schedule 1. 
So there is a GST liability, but it will not form part of turnover, is what I'm reporting in 9C, but exactly that amount is coming as a difference. When I report it, it comes, at a, it comes as a difference. It means what? In the PNL turnover, it has been already taken into consideration. The auditor, the statutory auditor was immediately able to come back to me saying, see, I have taken it as a sales on the credit set. I have taken it as a purchase on the debit set. No impact, no. I told him, yes, sir, no impact for me in GST. I will still report the difference and say that the difference is because of wrong reporting in income tax returns. There is no problem in GST. That I can write. But see whether income tax authorities will accept it. You are inflating your turnover. See whether the bankers will accept it. You have inflated the turnover. Now, that is a question which they have to settle. But this is to tell you practically what can happen. We cannot believe if it is matching. The intra-organization transfers can create differences and it is bound to create differences. We are supposed to reconcile that. Hence, look at the situation. One, whether there is any within the uh, say registration, rather uh, I would say within the distinct person transaction, one registration to other registration. If yes, how it has been accounted and how it has been eliminated to arrive at the turnover, which is externally. And here we have another unique situation. One, an unit is in Coimbatore, Tamil Nadu. They have another branch in Kochi, Kerala. What happens is the unit in Tamil Nadu manufactures the product A. The product A is not saleable. They do a stock transfer to Kochi. And now Kochi is finishing the product and from Kochi it is being sold to end customer. Their p and turnover was 4.5 crores. Their p and turnover was 4.5 crores. So they were saying that we are not liable to get audited under GST. But unfortunately, they are liable to get audited under GST because from Tamil Nadu to Kerala, whatever stock transfer that they did, that amounted to 2 crores. The Tamil Nadu to Kerala stock transfer, I'm not sure what has happened. Are you able to see my screen? Yes. Uh, no, sir. Uh, you have to. Yeah, suddenly the presentation has stopped. Now you are able to see? Yes. Yeah. Okay. The Tamil Nadu to Kerala stock transfer was 2 crores. It is a turnover which will get eliminated in the books of accounts because it will be shown as a sale from Tamil Nadu or outward supply from Tamil Nadu and inward supply to Kerala, but it is within the same company. So this is not going to be taken into consideration for income tax purpose. So this 2 crores is not there for income tax. What is there as a 4.5 crore is the outward sale from Kochi to the end customers. But if you combine these two turnover because GST takes into account not your P&L turnover, GST takes into account the aggregate turnover. So when we look at the aggregate turnover, it is 2 crore in Tamil Nadu, 4.5 in Kerala combined together 6.5 crores. As I see, one is liable to get audit under GST. Two, he is liable to file audit report both in the states of Tamil Nadu as well as in Kerala. So this is how this intra, the transaction between distinct persons can create differences. See whether the differences, see whether the, first the transaction is there. If the transaction is there, see whether it has been properly accounted and eliminated. If not, account for the differences. One. The next part is dubious areas. In deemed supply, we will have to take a stand. For example, food and transportation given free to the employee or it is given at a subsidized rate to the employee. What is the call? Is it a supply? No, no, sir. It is given as per the terms of employment. If it is given as a terms of employment, I agree. It will come under Schedule 3. Because Schedule 3 says if it is as per the terms of employment, for a service rendered by the employee to the employer, it is covered under Schedule 3. Suppose it is not getting covered under the employment contract. Still it is being given by the employer. In that case, whether it is given as free or it is given at a subsidized rate, it doesn't matter. In both the cases, it will become taxable. I'll repeat, in both the cases, it will become taxable. How it will become taxable? In, if it is free, that is the value. That is where section 15 subsection 1 comes into operation and says, if you are doing a transaction with a related person, explanation to section 15 says that employer and employee are related persons. Consequently, the transaction between related persons, transaction value will not be considered. 
the valuation shall have to be done as per 15 subsection 4, which diverts us directly to rule 28. And rule 28 says, step one, take the open market value and that shall be deemed to be the transaction value. So we are supposed to pay GST on the open market value. Transaction between employer and employer, very, very carefully to be handled. Second, transactions with employees where there is a gift. The gift is exceeding rupees 50,000 rupees per year. GST will certainly get attracted. It will become a deemed supply and we are supposed to pay GST on that. Schedule 1, para 2. That is the reason why I have given it here. The reason for giving it here is again, interesting practical encounter. What we saw was after 33 years of service, the head of the factory is leaving. So on the day of him leaving, which I believe was 30th, April 2018, the company gave his laptop, which he was using to him, as well as the uh, car that he was using, Honda City car, both were given to him as parting gifts. So it came across or we came across this uh, on a verbal communication with them. So they said, sir, where is that head? Uh, he, they said, yeah, he has gone, sir, we have given these two to you. Now imagine these two combinedly exceeds 50,000 uh, 50, rupees limit. He is leaving the organization. For that only you are giving him as a gift. It's a farewell gift. When you are giving it as a farewell gift, it is a gift and it is exceeding 50,000 rupees limit. Are we not supposed to pay GST on that? The answer is yes, they are supposed to pay, which we made them pay only when we are filing annual return. So this is another practical possibility which can happen in organizations. And moving to the next area, which I would say is grossly neglected area in GST is job work. Unless you have a client who is dealing in uh, automobile uh, spare parts manufacturing or who is in engineering industry kind of business, that is when we will see this job work activity happening more. Or in case of textile industries also, you would see this job work related things. In case of job work, section 143 read with section 19 of the CGST Act uh, gives a certain restriction. For 1718, these restrictions wouldn't have mattered. For the simple reason, the time limit itself is minimum time limit that is given for me uh, to consider a transaction with a job worker deemed to be a supply is one year. So 1st of July 2017, GST being brought in. Uh, by 31st of March 2018, even one year has not elapsed. It's only nine months. So in 1718, this provision was not that effective. But in 1819, I would say it is effective. And it assumes even more importance because if I had sent some goods in July 2017, I have not received it the whole of 1819 by the expiry of one year, that is July 2018, I have become liable to pay GST on that. If it is inputs which are sent to a job worker, it should come back within one year. It doesn't come back within one year. Section 143 says it shall be a supply. And what is even more uh, painful is it will become a supply not today, that is on the expiry of one year. It will be deemed to be a supply on the day on which it went out actually. So when it was, when it went out, it went out some uh, one year back. So that day itself, it will be deemed to be a supply, which means you cross one year, you are liable to pay interest for one year. The goods should have come back. This is even more potent in the hands of the department is because we were asked to file a quarterly statement for job work. That statement is called ITC 04, which we should have filed. But uh, like uh, in colleges, it happens, you no know, mass bunking. Many people refrained from filing that job work return. Initially, it had got technical problems. Subsequently, the technical problem got resolved. But even after that, people were hesitant or pushback was there. So what the department did in August 2019 is they waived it off for the first two financial years, 2017, 18 and 18, 19, ITC 02 was waived off. So it was made mandatory that we have to file it on a quarterly basis only from 1st of April 2019. Now, does that mean that for the previous two years, that is 17, 18 and 18, 19, I need not maintain job work register? No. You need not file the statement called ITC 04, but you must maintain job work register. You must maintain the record of what has gone to the job worker when it has come back. So the record maintenance has not been dispensed with, has not been given as a relief by the department. What has been given as a relief by the department is not to file the statement, which is ITC 04. That is what has been given as a relief to us, which is what we will have to keep it in mind while doing this job work related check. Any inputs sent to a job worker, whether it is received within one year. Any capital goods sent to a job worker, whether it is received within three years, this again will not make much relevance in 1890. Uh, Maybe in the coming days, we can see this. And if 
that two time limits are breached or any one of whichever situation you are falling under that time limit is breached it will be deemed to be a supply so apart from schedule one deemed supply can also come from section 19 or section 143 job work is also a place where deemed supply is residing it is not just in schedule one so we have to be aware of this moving further the next area all the VAT practitioners will be instantly aware of this when it comes to fixing the disposal we should not look at p and l we should look at fixed asset uh, schedule in the balance sheet when you look at the fixed asset schedule in balance sheet this will come to our mind the disposal of fixed assets disposal of fixed assets how it is done and the disposal of fixed assets on that disposal how the gst has been handled that is what is something which we are going to discuss now on disposal of fixed assets uh, for the purpose of gst i'll clarify one more time what is capital goods as per the provisions of GST? Capital goods is anything that is capitalized in the books of accounts is called as capital goods. It was not the same in uh, the uh, Senate Credit Rules 2004. That was not the definition. Rule 2K did not talk about what is capital goods or Rule 2A, I should say, is not uh, talking about capital goods. What it said is capital goods is anything that is falling under a particular HSM. Then only they were called as capital goods under the H2I law. But in GST, anything that is capitalized in the books of accounts is only called as capital goods. So that is a monumental change, which is why fixed asset register assumes importance. So in the fixed asset note, had there been any disposal, immediately we have to check. Check what? Check two kinds of things. Whether it is a disposal of a motor vehicle, motor vehicle that too on which ITC has been availed or not. 99% of the cases, it will be motor vehicle on which ITC has not been availed. Then we have to do the calculation as per notification 8 bar 2018. But on the other hand, if it is going to be a disposal of an asset, which is not in the nature of motor vehicle, but on which ITC has been availed. So ITC has been availed, then only 18 subsection 6 will come in and say, I will tell you the special procedure for calculating the liability on disposal of the capital goods. So first question to be asked is, is it motor vehicle or any other goods? In motor vehicle also, we have to ask another question. Have you availed ITC or not availed? If you have availed ITC, then you have to come to 18 subsection 6. If you have not availed ITC, then you can go to notification 8 bar 2018. For everything, including motor vehicle, on which ITC has been availed, the answer is section 18 subsection 6. What is the procedure of 18 subsection 6? I'll explain that first. Then maybe we can come to notification 8 bar 2018. Section 18 subsection 6 says that if you are disposing of any capital goods on which ITC has been availed, please ensure two calculations are done when the disposal happens. First, calculate GST on the transaction value of sale. When you are disposing, there is some value. On that value, calculate the current GST for that. Keep it. Go to step two. Step two is calculate ineligible ITC. Ineligible ITC for this capital goods. How can there be ineligible? They have not said what is ineligible. On the contrary, they have said what is eligible. If it is a capital goods on which ITC has been availed, you are entitled to avail only 5% of the input tax credit for every quarter or part of a quarter. So if I had purchased the asset on 1st of July 2017 and I have disposed the asset on 1st March 2019, I have put the asset to use for seven quarters, three quarters in 2017-18 and four quarters in 2018-19. So first March means it is only part of a quarter. Part of a quarter is also considered to be a quarter. So I've used it for seven quarters. Fine. You have used it for seven quarters. What next? You are entitled for only 5% per quarter or part of a quarter. So seven into 5%, I am entitled only for 35% of the original input tax credit. The total ITC on the capital goods which I availed you know, in July 2017 when I procured it, I am entitled only for 35% out of it. Then what about the 65%? Calculate. That is what is ineligible. This is step two. So step one, tax on the disposal value. Step two, the ineligible ITC, compare these two. Whichever is higher shall be the tax that is payable on the disposal of the capital goods. Whichever is higher shall be the tax that is liable to be paid on the disposal of capital goods. Sir, why did you take so much of time to explain this? I don't think this will be a practical issue. This is going to be the most important practical issue. 
especially 1718 and 1819 i will tell you how mobile phone purchased by managing director in um, indian penal code there is a section no which called shoot at sight like that in gst all the entrepreneurs have got a mindset uh, whenever they see gst they take itc they are not bothered whether it is for fuel or whether it is for uh, say ineligible credits they don't bother they come to the accountant and say see there is itc because this invoice contains gst you take input tax credits i have seen people on their flat maintenance directors flat maintenance they have come and give the bill to the company and say take itc the flat itself is in the name of the director how can you take input tax credit of that invoice just because it contains gst the company cannot take itc so this kind of over enthusiastic people would have certainly done two things electronic items laptops mobiles they would have taken itc laptops and mobiles rest assured nobody will use it especially this uh, kind of people who change it every year what would have happened is they are entitled only for 20% of the input tax credit because one year means only four quarters four quarters means 4 into 5% 20% only you become eligible let us say i have purchased one uh, top notch uh, mobile phone 1 lakh rupee 18000 rupees gst perfect in 2017 i purchased 2018 i disposed it off what will happen in 2018 if it is disposed off 1 lakh rupee mobile phone would have certainly gone only for 10000 rupees when it is given out for 10000 rupees there will be another problem the problem is the company would have shown it as disposal but they wouldn't have paid gst at all so why should they pay gst it is given as exchange please wait you are giving it as an exchange exchange is also a supply section 7 subsection 1 clause a says any kind of disposal or any kind of rental leasing licensing barter exchange sale transfer everything becomes supply so exchange is also a supply you are supposed to raise a tax invoice to the mobile shop fellow and then only give the invoice meaning give the goods you didn't do that so for, that is the first non compliance second is you are not pay tax on that okay you are disposing it of 10000 rupees we'll pay 18% of 10000 no you availed and credit of 18000 so you have to find out what is ineligible i've used it for one year if you have used it for one year 20% credit is only eligible 20% of 18000 is 3600 you are entitled only for 3600 you are supposed to pay a liability of 14400 Sir, but I am selling it only for ten thousand. Correct. You are selling it for ten thousand. You are liable to pay a GST of fourteen thousand four hundred. Imagine this situation. Has it not happened? In case of laptops, in case of mobiles, this will perpetually happen. Hence, ITC availment on electronic goods. Either we have to advise the client not to avail. If the client has availed, tell them not to dispose of within five years. Because if you keep it for five years, how many quarters we are using? Twenty quarters. Twenty into five percent per quarter. Hundred percent we would have used. so there won't be a need for step 2 calculation step 1 calculation itself will satisfy our need so we have to be careful to check this disposal of capital goods on which itc has been availed please do section 18 sub section 6 calculation to arrive at the liability and one more word of caution this disposal of capital asset the profit or loss will only hit the pnl the profit or loss will only come to the pnl the sales value will not come to the pnl but in gst invoice we are supposed to show the sales value the value at which you made the supply hence the supply value as per gst will obviously be more than the value at which it is recognized in pnl it will be a difference it should be a difference it is an allowed difference we have to we have to say this is why the difference is but there is no tax liability on account of this difference for that purpose only this difference will arise so keep that in mind now come to the second part of the discussion which is the motor vehicles on which itc has not been availed which has been disposed of from 25th of uh, january 2018 this notification became effective notification number 8 bar 2018 what is the effectiveness of this notification is if you are not availed itc and you are disposing of any motor vehicles and that motor vehicle is falling under hsn 87 chapter 87 then we need to pay gst only on the margin please do not get me wrong here i am not talking about rule 32 sub rule 5 which is a margin based taxation scheme prescribed for a person who is dealing in used goods i am not talking about that that is for a person who is dealing only in used goods for him that provision is there what we are discussing here is something which is specific to anybody who need not be a second hand dealer but somebody who is disposing of motor vehicles on which itc has not been availed by him in that situation what notification 8 bar 2018 says is that step 1 calculate your income tax wdv 
sir how will i calculate income tax wdv for one asset i will only have for the block calculate as if this is the only asset in the block then calculate the price at which you sold the vehicle okay let me give a numerical example mercedes benz has been sold the depreciated value wdv as per section 32 of the income tax act that stands as 8 lakhs i have sold it for 6 lakhs i have sold it for 6 lakhs the wdv is 8 lakhs 6 minus 8 is minus 2 lakhs negative margin this need not be taxed under gst at all we don't have to pay single rupee of gst on this suppose the wdv stands at 8 lakhs and i am selling it off at 10 lakhs wdv stands at 8 but i am selling it off at 10 then yes you need to pay gst on 2 lakhs you don't have to pay gst on the 10 lakhs you need to pay only on 2 lakhs and that too not the 28 percent rate the rate also has been prescribed in this notification as per which uh, depending upon the size of the vehicle i think the mercedes benz example it will be 18 percent so this is what is the importance of notification 8 bar 2018 read with section 18 subsection 6 for the purpose of disposal of capital goods during the financial year and the key question is is this applicable even for assets procured before gst in case of notification 8 bar 2018 i can nonchalantly say yes because the notification itself says that but in case of 18 subsection 6 i will put the question in a positive perspective saying the section doesn't say that but still we should take that into consideration meaning if you have not availed itc in the previous period then only you need to see that you have a relief in 18 subsection 6 if you have availed itc in the uh, previous period if you have availed itc in the previous period then still 18 subsection 6 will apply is my view so disposal of assets is something which we need to look at from the perspective of these two moving further a debit note or a credit note exceptional situations debit note credit note itself is viewed as an exception and when that happens especially if it is going to be a situation of incentive or discounts given by way of a credit note now that is what is going to be our key discussion for next 10 15 minutes now look at this trading and profit and loss account it looks like a 12th standard person trading and profit and loss account so forgive me for that insolence but it is done to uh, push a point so please have a look at it okay so in this case assume that the amounts are in thousands so don't ask me sir for this purpose why should i file annual return why should i file uh, gst 9c no assume that everything is thousand so now you will get a perspective question my total income as per my PNL is now 9 lakh and 50. Am I supposed to pay GST on this 50,000 is a key question. Because I have shown this 50,000 rupees. But what is this 50,000? Actually, this 50,000 is a discount. This 50,000 is a discount. Discount on what? This 50,000 is a discount that I have taken on my purchases. This is a discount on my purchases. But what have I done? See, this is how I was doing my accounting in pre-GST era also. Showing the discount received as income. Showing it as income doesn't mean it is a supply. Ideally, what I could have done is I could have set it off against this purchases of 7 lakh and 50 and shown 6 lakh and 50 thousand as my purchases. If I had done this, do we need to pay GST on this 50 thousand? No. But if I have not done this sheer fact that i have not done this and i am showing it as an income cannot be a root cause for gst liability because that is an income i don't want to deny that it is recognized as an income but gst is not on income gst is on supply the taxable event under gst is supply is it a supply no it is an adjustment to an supply when is the supply or what is the supply that has happened the supply that has happened is purchases the supply that has happened is purchase on the purchase there has been a discount that is given which means the purchase on which the discount is given is being shown as an income doesn't mean it is a supply in itself it is only an adjustment to a supply that has been made earlier so do i have to pay gst on this fifty thousand? i am of the view that i don't have to pay gst on this fifty thousand. having said that i will also address the other part that is when can a person issue a credit note? When can a person issue a debit note? Section 34 
of the CGST Act. That is from where I am borrowing this. And step one or situation one, credit note can be raised only in four situations. When I can raise a credit note, credit note is one when it is going to be a situation where my taxable value turns out to be higher than my actual value. My taxable value turns out to be higher than my actual value, which means actually I am supposed to charge, I, I am supposed to charge only less, but I have charged you more taxable value. So I am supposed to do a credit note to reduce the taxable value, reduction in taxable value or reduction in tax. The tax has been charged more, so I am reducing the tax. Second purpose for which a credit note can be issued. Third purpose, a credit note can be issued in case of sales return. Supply, supply is coming back, I can issue a credit note. This can happen only in case of goods. And the last situation for which I can raise a credit note is goods or services. When I have made a supply, it is considered as deficient. Supply of goods or services, which is considered to be a deficient supply of goods or services, then in those cases, I can issue a credit note. So only in the four situations, I can issue a credit note. So if I have made a supply to my customer, my supplier has not, my customer has not paid money to me. Can I raise a credit note? Answer is no, I cannot raise a credit note because bad debts is not a valid reason for raising a credit note under section 34. Section 34 doesn't talk about bad debts being a reason for raising a credit note. You cannot raise a credit note for bad debts. One. Second, in case of debit notes, when can I raise? Debit note is a situation where department will be happier because by raising a debit note, you are increasing the value of supply. You are increasing the tax. So consequently, the revenue is more interested because they will get more revenue out of this transaction. Hence, debit note is allowed only in two situations, whenever you are increasing the taxable value or whenever you are increasing the tax value. In these two situations, you will see a debit note being raised, whereas on the other hand, a credit note is for decreasing the taxable value, decreasing the tax value or sales return or deficiency in supply of goods or services can alone be the reasons when a credit note can be priced. Having seen this, a key question, 15 subsection 3 of the CGST Act talks about discounts. Now, this is the logical conclusion that we have to arrive at. Discounts are of two types. 15 subsection 3 clause A talks about discounts given at the time of supply, that is on the invoice. 15 subsection 3 clause B talks about post supply discount. Discount given the time of invoice, that is on or before making a supply, evident on the invoice, there is no restriction, any amount of discount can be given. On that GST need not be paid. Why am I saying GST need not be paid? Because it is an allowed exclusion from the taxable value as per 15 subsection 3. But when it comes to post supply discount, that the supply has been made at a certain value, subsequently a discount is being given. Now that is what is called a post supply discount. and for that, there are some restrictions. 15 subsection 3 clause B lays down three restrictions. It says, one, the discount must be pre-agreed. The discount or incentive should be pre-agreed. It should be calculated invoice-wise. So it cannot be an ad hoc amount. It has to be calculated invoice-wise. And the third one is, whatever is this discount that is being given by the supplier to the recipient. To the extent of the discount that is given, the recipient should reverse input tax credit. The recipient should reverse input tax credit. This is a tougher compliance to check. I'll tell an example from a cement industry perspective, which we are getting to see. The cement dealer will get the cement at a certain rate. And subsequently, what will happen? The cement company, which is getting the cement at a particular rate, Rather, from the cement company, the, the uh, distributor is getting at a particular rate. He will be told to sell at a lesser price. Maybe he is getting it for 400 rupees. He will be asked to sell at 350. He will sell at 350. Subsequently, 100 rupee credit note will come from the cement company. Now, my cost was originally 400. Now, it has become 300 because of this credit note. I have sold it for 350. What is the problem? The problem is, if it is a post supply discount, the cement company is telling to you that we have already agreed, pre-agreed and invoice wise they are giving me a discount and in the credit note they mention GST also on this 100 rupees. On 400 you would have paid GST earlier. Now on this 100 rupees they are reversing that 18 rupees worth of GST. Then only this discount is allowed as a deduction in the books of the cement company. Hence, if you are going to be auditing a distributor's books, you always insist on the cement company to give a credit note. No, no, sir, only statement of accounts is there. In statement of accounts, how can you verify whether GST is there or not? 
we cannot go by the gst i mean if, uh, assuming that gst is included in the statement of accounts it is always better to insist on the other person that is the seven company to give a credit note so in the credit note only we will be able to see whether the credit note has got gst in it or not there is a high possibility a person may not have pre agreed for such a discount just to push it in the market he might have given a discount and being aware of gst provision he might have given a credit note and that credit note is called as a financial credit note that credit note is called as a financial credit note there is no need for reversal of gst there so that is allowed between the supplier and the recipient there can be a discount that can happen between them on which gst impact is not there which is allowed but look at the situation i supplied something to you at 100 plus gst subsequently i am ready to reduce 10 but i don't want to touch gst gst is still 18 rupees paid to the department can we have such a transaction yes we can in my books as a recipient the transaction will look like this 90 rupees because 100 original price 10 rupee credit note 90 basic price 18 rupees itc i can avail 18 rupees itc where is it mentioned in the gst law that itc can be availed only in proportion to the basic value itc need not be availed in proportion to the basic value itc shall be availed as long as satisfies the conditions of section 16 and it is not blocked by section 17. so 18 rupees can be availed there need not be a reversal which is what i'm reiterating this 50,000 rupees that we saw here if it is given as a credit note with the gst itc should be reversed if it is given as a financial credit note without gst you don't have to reverse itc neither you have to pay gst because whatever tax has to be suffered on the seven lakhs has already been suffered why suffer one more time we don't have to there is no supply that is the point that i want to drive home with the discussion on debit notes and credit notes the incentives or discounts which flow from the supply to the recipient now who can issue a debit or a credit note a debit or a credit note can be issued only by a supplier now all the accountants will have a view sir anybody can issue correct but gst says only a supplier issuing debit or credit note is valid if it is not issued by a supplier it is not a valid debit or a credit note so that we will have to keep it in mind so we will always have to get it when we are the supplier we have to give it when we are the recipient we have to get it and the credit note or debit note shall be the only documents for adjustment of an invoice so in case of a supplementary invoice especially in the erstwhile era we used to call it a supplementary invoice a retrospective price revision supplementary invoice we cannot issue a supplementary invoice in gst it has to be called as a debit note and the debit note will come along with tax liability because you are issuing a supplementary invoice you are liable to pay gst on that now here i have a question meaning a situation what had happened is a company which is supplying to an automobile major all of 2017 18 and 18 19 they have made supplies and that auto major is giving them a retrospective price revision we will discuss with a practical example 31st of December 2018, I have made a supply to you. 31st of December 2000, okay, let me, let's, let me put it like this. 31st of December 2017, I have made a supply to him for 1 lakh rupee plus GST. That's it. May 2018, 5 months from there, there is a price revision. He has given me a price increase of 20%. So I am paying 20% extra, or I am liable to be getting 20% extra, I am eligible. So I am raising a debit note in May 2018 for 20,000 rupees plus GST, of course. Now well, the question is, should I pay interest on this GST on 20,000? I'll repeat, the original invoice was raised in December 2017. Tax on that original invoice was paid by 20th of January 2018, which is the due date for December 2017. But the price increase has come to me only in May 2018. And in May 2018 only, I am raising a debit note with the GST and I am going to pay this GST to the department only by 20th of June 2018. Am I liable to pay interest on this increase in price on which I am liable to pay GST? 20,000 rupees on which GST is 3,600. Am I liable to pay G interest on the 3,600? The answer is a resounding yes. So why sir, the in increase in price itself was, not only, was known only in May 2018. How can you say I am liable to pay interest? you are liable to pay interest for the simple reason that the taxable value is now 1 lakh and 20 situation one the second important point is the time of supply is not for a debit note the time of supply is for an invoice section 12 deals with time of supply for goods and it says invoice is the 
time of supply or the time of supply originates from the invoice, not from a debit note, except in three situations. The debit note can become the time of supply. The date of debit note can become the time of supply if the debit note is raised for the purpose of collecting interest penalty or late fees for the purpose of delay in payment. I am making a supply to you. You are not paying within 30 days. So I am charging a late fee on you. On that late fee, I need not pay GST unless I realize it from you. That is an exception provided under section 12, subsection 6 and 13, subsection 6. 12, subsection, subsection 6 for goods, 13, subsection 6 for services. That exception does not apply to a retrospective price revision. Hence, in the old VAT regime, we wouldn't have paid interest on that. But in excise regime, this was always there. So we are liable to pay on this debit notes. That is the supplementary invoices impact. The impact of supplementary invoice by way of a debit note in GST. Tax has to be paid. On the tax, the interest has to be paid. From when? From the original time of supply. We are supposed to go in that order and pay GST. Moving to the next aspect. The time limit for issuing a debit note or a credit note. We have to be mindful of that also. For a financial year, the credit note, for there is a time limit. For debit note, there is no time limit. The time limit for credit note is the credit note must be issued before September of the following financial year or before filing the annual return, whichever is early. But when it comes to a debit note, there is no time limit because you know very well when it, when it becomes a debit note, there is a liability to be paid from our end. So the more we delay, the more interest the department can ask from us. So there is no time limit for it. But for a credit note where there is a reduction in liability that we are going to do, then the department says, yes, you will have to have a timeline which is September of the following financial year. So ideally for 2017-18, it was September of 2018. This time limit was never extended. The ITC availment time limit and all got extended but this time limit remains the same. Hence, it is September of the following financial year for 2017-18, 18-19, 19 also. So this is what is pertaining to the adjustments in turnover which can cause an impact in our GST audit. So moving to the next aspect, reverse charge. Uh, at this juncture, I want to ask the uh, organizing team, sir, can we take a uh, say five minute or a 10 minute recess break that is? Yes, sir, you can take, sir. Sure. So hope uh, you will also, all of the members who are attending also will appreciate a break. Sure. Um, we'll catch up uh, after say 10 minutes. Sure.
we'll start in another minute uh, pradeep yes sir we can start few questions we have received sir in uh, q and a is there actually we can uh, discuss uh, later in the after the sessions or we can discuss now oh, i think i can take it now just a moment okay. hmm. the question is not complete yes been paid through cash lens invoice has also been included in gstr 1 customer is not taking credit for the invoice as it has been cancelled how is this to be adjusted in gst returns can this be adjusted in gst or not tax is recovered i'm not able to understand this question tax has been paid through cash ledger is what he is saying yes invoice has also been included in gst or one okay customer is not taking credit for the invoice as it has been cancelled they okay. have cancelled uh, the invoice after the filing okay so this if it is goods you can anyway raise a credit note for the goods that are returned so to uh, to the extent of credit note if it had been raised within the time limit you would have got the uh, money back from the department meaning you can adjust with the next liability if it is services uh, then cancellation is a question mark it cannot be a cancellation you can you cannot recover the service no that you have rendered so mm -hmm. you have to be careful there for services i wouldn't uh, say the credit note route is possible next one in case of deemed turnover under section 143 the amount of turnover to be included in 1819 or 1718 were input sent in july 17 but not received by july 18 ah in this case the turnover will form part of july i mean it is a turnover of july 2017 only but you cannot go back and report it in july 2017 so you have to report it as part of 18 but the tax will have to be paid along with interest invoice raised in march 2019 for service is cancelled after gstr 3b for the month is filed invoice raised in march 2019 for service is cancelled after gstr 3b for the month is filed hmm okay the gst has been paid the invoice was included in gstr 1 how is this to be adjusted in gst returns can this be adjusted in gst and taxes recovered Okay, I'm assuming it is for goods or service invoice raised. Okay, for service. service. Ah. Okay, the service invoice is cancelled. You can try sir because you you have to prove that there was no supply. Technically speaking, a credit note cannot be raised for this. Ideally, you can apply for a refund for it under section fifty four sub section eight, where there is a provision to say that when the supply has not happened. But uh, the provisions of time of supply section thirteen says that. when you raise an invoice it is deemed that to the extent of invoice the supply is already over so you become liable to pay gst on that supply hence it is a contentious matter i don't think you can easily recover or set off the deputation of employee from one unit to other unit of the same company for the for performing the duty leads to supply of service or not you are talking about uh, between the uh, distinct person the columbia asia hospitals kind of uh, question that you are asking uh first uh, point that i would give as an answer is yes it will it will be treated as a supply but how you will bill for it will be determined by rule 28 that is what would be my uh, submission because rule 28 there are two provisos which says if you are going to make a supply to a distinct person and the supply that which you are making to a distinct person is not that is the supply that is being made to a distinct person is going to be uh, eligible for input tax credit for the other person let's say your karnataka branch is raising an invoice on west bengal branch for whom this person has been sent on deputation the west bengal branch is eligible for full input tax credit on this invoice then whatever value you put in the invoice is deemed to be the open market value so you don't have to raise a separate uh, i mean find out the open market value and charge gst on that your invoice value is deemed to be the open market value so there is no issue in that there is one more question in chat i think yes uh, in chat section there is one more question yeah, sir i am able to see that excess itc claimed in 3b and same bills also there in books during audit it shows that bills do not belong to concerned client but to his father's firm 
how to present the excess ITC in GST 9 and 9C. You have claimed excess ITC and that is not belonging to you. You simply have to reverse it. And the reversal has to be paid by DRC 03. That cannot be a reversal of ITC. We will discuss about the legality of it later in my presentation. I've got a slide to discuss on this. But how it has to be disclosed, it has to be shown as a reversal. It is not eligible for you. You have oiled it in 3B. So 3B will show this as a credit. You will have to disown this credit. That is how it should be disclosed in GSTR 9 and 9C. Okay. Those being the questions, I think now we will get back to the presentation. Yeah. Yeah. The other area that one has to look at while doing the GST annual returns is the RCM. Section 9, subsection 3 and 9, subsection 4. 9, subsection 3, reverse charges. 9, subsection 4, reverse charges are not available, are not applicable for the whole of 2018-19. So there we don't have an issue. For 9, subsection 3 only, we would have a situation. So look at all those reverse charge possibilities to rule out whether this has been considered or not. So goods related reverse charges, these are the ones which have been applicable for 18-19. Uh, so, in that part of the geography, there are possibilities that this kind of transactions could have been done. So, when you are procuring goods, which are in the nature, which are mentioned in this table, uh, it is a combination of other notifications that have come for reverse charge. I have given a combined uh, view of it. So, any of this you are going to procure and you are going to fall within the supplier definition. The most important one I would say is this one. When you are buying the used vehicles or seized goods or confiscated goods, used goods from the government, uh, that is the central government, state government, or union territory, or local authority, you as a registered person is liable to pay GST on the reverse charge. Whereas lottery is something which is specific only to the state of Kerala. Raw cotton, tobacco leaves, or BD uh, uh, leaves, that is the Tendu leaves, or cashew nut, which is raw cashew nut, in all these cases, the recipient, the registered person who is receiving it, is only liable to pay GST and not the agriculturist or the manufacturer who is selling it. So these will have to be taken into consideration for the purpose of identifying reverse charge mechanism under 9 subsection 3 for goods. Going to the next part, the reverse charge mechanism under 9 subsection 3 for services. So when it comes to 9 subsection 3 for services, uh, what, it, what we need to look at is import of service. Situation where location of the supplier is outside India, location of the recipient is in India and tax and the place of supply falls in India, we are liable to pay GST under reverse charge. If all the three conditions are satisfied, it is considered to be an import of service. If it is an import of service, we are liable to pay GST under reverse charge. Check whether these transactions have happened. An easy way to check this is 15 CA, 15 CB. Any foreign currency remittances, we can go through that and easily find out whether such transactions have happened. The other one is the most famous one, the goods transport agency related services. The GTA related services, where the GTA is charging uh, rather, he is not charging 6 plus 6, 12 percent. That is under the CGST notification, 6 plus 6, 12 percent, he is not charging. That means in all the other cases, other than him charging 6 percent, 6 plus 6, 12 percent, in all the cases, the recipient happens to be the person who is liable to pay GST under reverse charge. So, as a recipient, have you done this? Is a question that one may have to answer for goods transport agency services. Legal services. Legal services by a lawyer. An advocate or a firm of advocate or a senior advocate, in all these cases, the business entity who is receiving the services is liable to pay. Arbitral tribunal services, the business entity is liable to pay. Sponsorship services, when it is received by a business entity, the business entity, that is the business entity which is a body corporate or a partnership firm, they are liable to pay GST under reverse charge. So these we can easily find out from the PNL. The legal charges, the uh, arbitral tribunal services or the sponsorship services. Sometimes sponsorship services might be hiding inside donations also. So please unearth it to see whether reverse charges are applicable there. And then any services received from government, we are liable to pay GST under reverse charge. Any licenses, any uh, kind of right to operate that we obtain from government, we are liable to pay under reverse charge. If you are a registered person, then even a renting from government, we are liable to pay GST under reverse charge. Maybe a uh, industrial estate, we have taken a land, we are liable to pay GST under reverse charge. The other one which has got uh, the momentum going in the last three months, especially after the circular number 140, is services by a director. Now, the provision of this uh, reverse charge mechanism notification, notification 13 by 2017 CGST rate notification, says services by a director to a body corporate. It doesn't say what type of services. 
It says services by a director to a body corporate. Now the circular has clarified only the remuneration part. Any services by a director to a body corporate, it is coming under reverse charge. So the services by a director to a body corporate, the body corporate will have to pay GST under reverse charge. That is certain. Now there, is it only remuneration that is getting covered? I don't think so. Because the wordings that are used is services by a director. It is not directorship services by a director. Now, when you look at the legal services angle, there they will be mentioning that legal services by an advocate are a form of advocates. So there it is legal services. If a, if a lawyer is giving some other services, then that will be taxable under forward charge. Reverse charge will not come. But in case of services by a director, they have just mentioned director services. That is services rendered by a director to a body corporate. Now, I'll give an example. There are situations where directors would have given collateral on behalf of the company. They wouldn't have charged anything to the company. They would have given personal guarantee, personal collateral. Fine. They have not charged anything. So what? It is still a supply. How can it become a supply, sir? Because it is a related party transaction. The director is having control over the organization. So it is a related party transaction. Yes. Second question, if it is a related party transaction, there is no consideration. Is it still a supply? Yes, that is what is deemed a supply. Schedule 1, para 2. So it becomes a deemed a supply. When it becomes a deemed a supply, what is that? Next step. When it becomes a deemed a supply, what happens next is, irrespective of what is the price that is charged, open market value will only be taxable. So we have to be careful in that situation also. So services by a director, anything and everything can come. So far, what the department has clarified is only remuneration. And there in remuneration also, the clarification that they have given has raised questions. For example, I am a doctor. I am not a doctor. I am saying I am a doctor. I have founded a hospital along with another doctor. Both of us are directors. We are not managing directors. We are directors and we are receiving remuneration from the organization. And that remuneration, they are doing TDS under section 194J. They are not doing it under 192. So we are not employees. They are doing it under 194J. Now the question is, are we liable to pay GST? Now for this question, there are two answers that can come out. One is, yes, it is being done under 194J. Now look at this circular, it says 194J means reverse charge is there. But look at the other important provision, which is the exemption notification 12 bar 2017. It says, any kind of healthcare services provided, it is exempted, no? Sir, how can you say director is providing healthcare services to the company? Now, in this case, he is providing services as a doctor or as a director? Question mark. So, I will assume that he is providing his services as a doctor. That is why 194J is being done because in profession, in income tax, we are showing it as a doctor profession. 194J, DDS, we are replacing there. Hence, here also it should be called as doctor. If it is a doctor services to a clinical establishment, then it becomes an exempted service. There is a circular in June 2018 which also clarifies this. When that is from a different angle of exemption, but combined reading of these two will give us a meaning. The director services, everything will become reverse charge. One, and their remuneration part alone has been clarified by the department so far, is what I would say. Insurance agency services, same way recovery agent services, all these cases, the bank or the, ins the insurance company is liable to pay under reverse charge. Ocean freight, a contentious point which has been struck down by uh, Gujarat High Court. Uh, it is only Gujarat High Court judgment has not come across India. So still department will raise issues on this ocean freight. CIF basis import. If we have done, they will ask us to pay on the GST uh, on the freight portion, reverse charge. And then any kind of copyright, especially relating to dramatic musical or literary work. In all these cases, the recipient, the publisher or the music company will be asked to pay the GST under reverse charge and one more service which crept into reverse charge in 2018-19 was security services. Security services provided to a person by a, I mean by a person who is other than a body corporate to any person who is a registered person then the registered person is liable to pay GST under reverse charge. That is what is for security services. So see whether all these reverse charges have been taken into consideration for the purpose of arriving at our annual liability. And when we avail input tax credit, Rule 36 sub Rule 1 says presence of any one of this document is mandatory. If you are availing ITC, it should be either backed up by a tax invoice or it should be backed up by a self invoice. When would self invoice come? Whenever it is a reverse charge supply and the other person is unregistered. In those cases, as per the provisions of Section 31 subsection 3 clause F, we are supposed to raise a self invoice. That self invoice is the basis for availing input tax credit, not the payment shell 
So there you will have this self invoice coming into picture for availing input tax credit. Debit note by a supplier, third situation. Obviously, when invoice, I can take input tax credit. On debit note also, I can take input tax credit. But debit note comes, ITC also comes. I can take ITC on that. And bill of entry, the customs document based upon which input tax credit can be availed in GST. Under section 3, subsection 7 of the customs tariff act, I would have paid IGST. I can avail ITC based upon bill of entry. And finally, an ISD invoice. The head office is distributing the credit to the other parts of the entity through an ISD invoice. Based on that, I can avail ITC. So, practically seeing item number 1, 2, and 3 are most common. I, item number 1, 2, and 4 are also most common. 5 may be a rarity, but if you avail any ITC, if there is one entry in your input tax credit ledger, register, that must be backed with any one of this document. If any one of this document is not there, the ITC is not a valid ITC. Going further, the challenge area for us as persons who are certifying the uh, reconciliation statement or doing an audit is this. The input tax credit shall have to be reversed, Rule 37, reversal, read with Section 16 where we have not paid to the supplier the taxable value and the tax value within 180 days from the invoice date. The key thing uh, here is, I'll go in the reverse order, the key thing is invoice date. It is not on the date on which I booked the invoice, it is the date on which the invoice was raised by my supplier. So, I'm not sure how many of the assessees will maintain credit as aging. If they are, maintained, if they are maintaining credit as aging also, how many of them would maintain it from the invoice date of the supplier? They will maintain credit as aging from the date on which they have received the invoice. I don't think they will be maintaining from the date on which the supplier has raised the invoice. If it is there, we are supposed to check this 180 days condition. Now there again, for the purpose of our understanding, auditors usage, we have to be aware of this words also, which is there in section 16 subsection 4, which says when we fail to make the payment within 180 days. What is failure to make payment? When the payment is expected, we don't pay. But then how do I prove that the payment is not expected? If your credit period is going to exceed 180 days, it is not a failure to make payment. This can be a plausible reason for not paying within 180 days. But if that has not been agreed, then we are liable to reverse the input tax credit within that uh, on expiry of that 180 days. Now, once you have reversed the ITC, what is the recourse? Rule 37 sub rule 4 says that whenever it is subsequently paid, you can avail the ITC without any time limit. GSTR 9 table 7 will contain a line called as any other ITC. The last entry before the total. What is that entry for? That is only for such reclaimed ITC because 2017-18 invoice you might have reversed the ITC for not paying within 180 days in 2017-18 itself. That amount you happen to pay in 2018-19, now you become entitled to take input tax credit. You can avail that credit. It need not be in 2A. It will not be in 2A. Because in 18-18, 2A it will not be there, no? It will be there only in 17-18. Maybe you, you are paying it only in 19-20. You can avail it now. So Rule 37 sub Rule 4 gives that elongated period. It says whenever you make the payment, you can avail it, proportionate to the payment that you have made. Once you have reversed it after 180 days. So this 180 days reversal is one part. Have you done the reversal? Yes. And subsequently, when it is paid, you can avail the ITC without any time limit. There is no time limit for re-availment of such credit. And a critical aspect, especially in the p and uh, I'm using the word p and because that is from where we can pick up this data. Our assessee is going to have both taxable as well as exempted, mostly agriculture. Output is both taxable as well as exempted. Maybe I'll take an example of a milk dairy or a person who is having, uh, say, windmills also, plus some other business. Now, the some other business will be taxable. Windmill is generating electricity, which is exempt. That electricity is being sold to the electricity department. All the more reason, it is an exempted output. Likewise, we can have various combinations. Exempted is also there in your output. Taxable is also there in your output. 16, section 16 very clearly says, only on your taxable and zero rated outward supplies, you can avail ITC. Section 17, subsection 2 categorically denies or blocks the credit which is pertaining to anything other than taxable or zero rated output. Zero rated is supply to an SEZ or supply outside India, exports or supply to SEZ. Taxable is on which tax has been paid. There is no reason to worry about whether the tax rate is lower or higher. Tax should have been paid. So that is where we have to be careful. If your output is going to have exempted also, 
sir knows that we are a manufacturing company we are doing only manufacturing we will never have exempted output they are doing exports also then there is a catch practically what we have seen is these uh, people when they export they will get a uh, meis license from the department the dgft direct general of foreign trade will give them a meis license as a benefit merchandise export from india scheme once they take that license some of them will use it for payment of customs duty subsequently some of them will sell the license i'll repeat they will sell the license when they sell the license the license is exempted under gst from 14th of november 2017 it has been exempted earlier it was 12 percent then they reduced it to five and then they exempted these licenses no these licenses turnover is there in your output so there is an exempted turnover in your output you have to reverse itc but that is where the reversal of itc have to be carefully done as per rule 42. rule 42's importance i've tried capturing it Though if you read Rule 42, um, it will take me back to my algebra days in school. It will talk about uh, T1 plus T2 plus T3, C1 plus C, uh, D2, C2, D2. Uh, let's forget all that. Let's go through a logical approach. It was there already in the S2L similar to the rules, Rule 63. It was there. So the same logic only they have contemplated in Rule 42. What was there as a logical conclusion is this only. Take the total ITC that is pertaining only to input and input services. Capital goods, this is not applicable. Capital goods rule 43 is applicable. So for the common outputs that you have, take the input and input uh, input and input services related credits. First, remove all the credit which is pertaining to the ineligible category, that is 17 subsection 5, non-business related, all this you remove. When you remove this, what you will be left with is the remaining credit. That credit further be uh, dissected into two parts. One is specific to activity common. What is common? You don't have to find out common. Find out which is specific. Out of the remaining, whatever you find out as specific, remaining is common. So this will become, ideally, the other credits will become a balancing figure. So find out what is credit which is specific to an activity. Specific to taxable activity, fully avail input tax credit. Specific to exempt activity, fully not avail input tax credit. Specific to taxable activity, full eligibility. Specific to exempt activity, full ineligibility. This is where it is different from VAT provisions in some of the states because earlier we used to do this proportionate turnover here. So we used to say exempted turnover by total turnover here in the VAT regime, which is not applicable in GST. In GST, the proportionate has to be done only for this balancing figure credit. For this only, proportionate to taxable activity eligible, proportionate to exempted activity ineligible. So this is what is the importance of Rule 42. So this calculation shall have to be done. And accordingly, the ITC pertaining to exempted activity shall have to be reversed. Now, I'll tell you from where we will have leads also. In income tax purposes, uh, we would have said that some expenditure we would have disallowed or we would have partially disallowed, say, used for personal purpose. Let's say telephone expenditure. You have said that 20% is personal. Remaining 80% only are considered for business purpose. Now, on that invoice of the telephone bill, if you had availed the full ITC, you are wrong, no? How can you say for income tax purpose, 20% is personal and for GST purpose, 100% is official. If you said for income tax purpose, it is 20% personal, then to that extent, you should have reversed the ITC and GST also. These are all the areas where we will have to have a harmony in disclosure, both in income tax as well as in GST, cannot be a discrete disclosure. Rule 42 will help us do that. ITC reversals will arise. Yes, if it arises, you have to advise for that reversal. And then, uh, section 17, subsection 5, critical part only, goods lost, stolen, destroyed. I'm segregating it into two parts, lost, stolen, destroyed first. So what is lost, what is stolen? Lost, let's say, 31st of March 2019, there is a physical verification of inventory. In the physical verification, there is a shortfall. You will not give a police complaint, you will not claim insurance, you will just write it off. Because it is not there, lost. Whatever that you say, there is a shortage in a particular uh, item, to the extent you are removing that item from your stock to the extent ITC should also be reversed. Let's say you are a supermarket. You found that uh, particular biscuit item is uh, two numbers short or two trays short. What will you do? You would have taken ITC, you know, when you procured it. Now you have to reverse it because it is lost. Stolen. Okay, pull for it. They have, somebody has uh, taken it out. Fine. You have not used it for your business. It is no more with you. Reverse. You can claim insurance including GST. That is your uh, ability with the insurance company. But in GST, you will have to reverse the ITC. Destroy any man-made disaster, natural disaster, because of which it is no more usable. It has become destroyed completely. ITC reversed. 
So these are the first three parts of section 17, subsection 5, class H. Then goods which are written off, something which only an accountant will understand. What is write off? Only accountants know what is write off because physically it will be there, in book it will not be there. That is what is called write off. When you writing it off, you have to reverse ITC. Watch the words carefully. When you are making a provision for write off, you don't have to reverse. I'll repeat, when you are making a provision for write-off, you don't have to reverse. Where is it mentioned, sir? You please refer the S2 by Rule 4 of Senate Credit Rules with the 17 subsection by Class H. You will see the words provision for write-off is missing. In the S2 by Senate Credit Rules, they mentioned whether you make a write-off or a provision for write-off. In both the cases, you will have to reverse Senate Credit. But in GST, they have just mentioned the word write-off. They have not mentioned the word provision for write-off. Hence, provision for write-off, you don't have to reverse ITC. But write-off, you have to reverse ITC. And when goods are given away by way of gift or free samples, ITC has to be reversed. Another contentious area. I will say anything that you give as free, free samples or gift. What is the difference between the two? A subtle line of difference. Free sample is what is my product. I give it as free sample. What is gift? I might procure it and give it free. In both the cases, ITC shall have to be reversed. But there are equally strong opposite views saying this is not given free. This is for the purpose of gaining market share. This is for the purpose of business development. So I will avail ITC. Fine. I am of the view that when you are giving it free, there is no entitlement of ITC. You will have to reverse it. That's it. Now the impact areas will be this is what we have to go through if it is there in the annual accounts of a person. Physical verification, shortage of inventory or giving goods free but giving it for warranty purposes. Now when you are giving it free, you don't have to reverse ITC. Because it is not given free, the warranty is already imbibed into the original supply. When I sold the goods to you, I told you that I give I am giving a warranty for one year. So the sale of goods is actually a composite supply of a promise also that I will replace it within one year if it goes bad. Hence, for that purpose, if I am giving you something free, it, ITC need not be reversed because it is under warranty. Whereas, if it is given free, there is no pre-built contract, it is just given free. You have to reverse ITC. And further, goods used for testing, it will be tested by breaking it. Then only the testing, the sample uh, sample testing will be done and then only the lot will be accepted. For that broken sample, can I avail ITC? My view is yes, because it is used in the course or furtherance of business. It is not destroyed. It is calculatively tested. So eligible for ITC. New Year gets Diwali gifts, I leave the option to you because I already told you where the problem lies, two lines of thought. My view is you have to reverse ITC. And then any inventory written off, you have to reverse ITC. But provision for slow moving inventory, you don't have to reverse ITC. Impairment of fixed assets is not a write off, so you don't have to worry about ITC reversal. So these are the impact areas that one have to be mindful read with in, uh, the input tax credit provisions in the books of accounts. And then the areas where, as the auditors, we might add value is the LUT conditions. Anybody is doing export of goods or supply to an SEZ without payment of IGST, they would have obviously subscribed for an LUT under Rule 96. That LUT, that which they have given to the department, LUT is one of the easiest process. You, you ask anybody in the office, they will be able to do. They will go there, click three buttons, and then give two people's name as uh, witness, submit. Next minute, ARN will come, but ARN is LUT number. But in the three buttons which we are clicking, we are actually accepting something. That acceptance that which we are giving is, if it is going to be export of goods, I will send the goods outside India within three months from the date of invoice. That is what is the assurance or the undertaking that which we are giving to the department. If you are not going to send the goods within three months from the date of invoice, then you are agreeing that as per rule 96A, that I will pay to the department the tax that is the IGST plus interest for this period within 15 days from the expiry of three months. This is what is the undertaking that which we are giving the small ticks that we are making now that is an undertaking. And it is even more impactful in case of services. In case of services, what you are saying is within one year from the date of invoice, I will realize the money in convertible foreign exchange. If I don't realize the money in convertible foreign exchange within this one year, from the rate of invoice, then I will pay the IGST with interest within 15 days from the expiry of one year. Now, this is impactful from a statutory audit perspective also. Let us take the example of a software company, IT or ITES company, which has raised an invoice on a foreign customer. That foreign customer debtor balance has remained outstanding for more than one year. Does it not directly attract this LUT condition? They are liable to pay tax, they are liable to pay interest on the tax also. 
So, but subsequently they realize the money. Subsequently they realize the money. They can apply for refund for the tax that has been paid, but they cannot ask for interest as refund. Interest is an expense, certain. So, these LUT conditions, whether the assessee has fulfilled, is something which we have to see. So, why should I see in a GST audit? Because of this, additional liability can arise. No. So, this we have to see. And to this, there is extra masala that is added by the latest amendment on 23rd of March 2020 by way of notification number 16 bar 2020. This new rule has been inserted in the uh, CGST rules, rule 96B. Rule 96B brings in something uh, which is unique. In case of services, export of services, it is considered as an export only when you realize the money in convertible foreign exchange. In case of goods, there was no such condition. If it is leaving India to a place outside India, it is considered to be export. That's all. It is leaving India to a place outside India, it is considered to be an export. That is all that was there in rule uh, in the existing provisions of section 2 subsection 5 of the IGST Act for defining something as export. Now they have inserted a rule 96B to say if you are making export of goods from India, sending it outside India, no problem. But you want to claim refund. I'll repeat, they are not questioning exports. But if you are claiming refund for export of goods, then I want to put a condition that on the export of goods for which you are claiming refund, the money should have been realized within the time limit fixed by FEMA. And FEMA says it is nine months from the date of invoice. We are supposed to realize the money in convertible foreign exchange. Invoice meaning the date on which the goods left India. Within nine months, we are supposed to realize the money in convertible foreign exchange. So it is actually not a precondition for refund, it is a post condition. Sir, that is only for refund. Now, where is it affecting me in GST? And that to this provision you said is coming only from uh, 23rd of March 2020. Where is it impacting 1819? It is impacting 1819 because we are signing the audit report only after 23rd March 2020. No? So, the assessee had done any export during the year on which this fellow has claimed a refund. Sir, why should I worry about refund in 9C? You are supposed to worry because 2 subsection 13 verification includes refund also. We are supposed to verify the correctness of tax liability, turnover, Input tax, credit and refund, specifically told. So we are supposed to talk about refund there. There, if he had done an export invoice in 2018-19, for which he has not received the money in convertible foreign exchange within nine months, or he has received it after nine months, or he has not received at all. In these two scenarios, how are we going to qualify it in our report? We have to make our mindset ready. First, we have to collect the data, then we have to qualify. So please bear this provision in mind, though it is not retrospective, the impact is becoming retrospective because we are signing it 1819 audit report now only pertaining to refund. And this is more dangerous if a person is going for the with the payment of IGST route export of goods. Export of goods with payment of IGST, the refund will be credited by the customs department. So GST department, we wouldn't have even applied for refund. but. As auditors, we are the last before line of defense. GST audit by the department is the last line of defense. We have to tell to the department whether this gentleman has actually raised the money in convertible foreign exchange or not. Sir, he has taken the money from customs department, but he has written off the data in books. Then he is not entitled for the refund. He is supposed to give back the refund to the department with interest. Rule 96B is impact. So export related provisions, please be aware of this qualifications. Both LUT as well as the new introduction of Rule 96B. The other area where we have to be careful is liquidated damages. Now, is liquidated damages a supply? Answer is a resounding yes. That is what department wants to believe. Schedule 2, entry number 5E says that agreeing to the obligation to refrain from an act, to tolerate an act or a situation, to do or not to do for a consideration shall become a supply only. Liquidated damages. So, liquidated damages, whether it has been properly accounted by the SSE. For example, notice period pay recovery. Are we going to treat it as a supply or not? I'm not uh, disputing, I'm just saying you have to take a call. You can decide that, sir, no, sir, it is not a supply. You can take a call that it is a supply. Accordingly, make the SSE pay, give a declaration in the GST observation also in the 9C. The next one is interest liability. This has been uh, very well clarified in the last week's uh, uh, note by the department. That is, whether I have to pay interest on the gross liability or net liability. What they have told is, whatever, not uh, whatever notices have been issued by the department in the old period, that is prior to 1st September 2020 for recovery of interest on gross liability shall all stand stalled, stopped, temporarily stopped. So they don't want to do that because the government has given a word that they are going to make the amendment retrospectively from 1st July 2017 
that interest is going to be only on net, not on gross. Net meaning to the extent of what is paid out of the cash ledger only interest is liable, not to the extent of what is paid out of ITC. So to that extent, we are saved. To that extent, you don't have to worry about net uh, gross liability payment of interest, only net liability payment of interest, one. But 18% interest should I pay or 24% interest should I pay? 50 subsection one talks about 18% interest, 50 subsection three talks about 24% interest. 50 subsection one says, whenever there is a delay in payment of tax, 18% interest per annum. But whenever ITC has been unduly availed, wrongly availed, or tax liability has been wrongly reported, 24%. Hence, which is the scenario that is getting attracted, that has to be checked. And further, the additional liability that is prescribed by the auditor shall have to be paid in DRC 03. Uh, mostly what will happen is GSTR 9, we will say that it is the assessee's responsibility, but like income tax return, uh, 3CD is only our responsibility. Uh, income tax return is his problem, but still we will be doing it. Same way GSTR 9 also will be mostly done by us only. In those cases, DRC 03 is the only way in which the additional liability arising out of GSTR 9 or 9C shall have to be paid, is what is told. But interestingly, where is it told? It is not told in section 49. It is not told in the rules. It is in fact told in the instruction to GSTR 9 and 9C. I do not know what is the legal sanctity of it. GSTR 9 and 9C instructions only it is told, any additional liability arising out of annual return shall have to be paid only by cash. So if you ask me the legal sanctity, sir, where is it mentioned in the section? I don't have. Neither the section talks about it, nor the rule talks about it. Part B to the GST rules, which contains the list of forms. In the forms for the instruction, it is mentioned. I do not know how far it can have an impact on our section. Can the rule say something which the section doesn't intend to say uh, is a question that can arise. So to answer one of the questions which had come in the chat during the break, where uh, I think a person had asked, we have wrongly availed ITC. That is, uh, father's firm's ITC has been availed by this form. In other words, simply wrongly availed ITC. How am I supposed to treat it in GSTR 9? Show it as a reversal. Now, when I show it as a reversal in ITC, if I have ITC today, I have two options. To reverse that ITC as an ITC today, that is DRC 03 to reverse ITC, or DRC 03 to pay that additional liability in cash. Whether I have to choose cash payment or ITC, I leave it to you. Again, it is a legal battle. To me, there is no legal sanctity in the hands of the department to say you have to pay only by cash. It is only a word that is mentioned in instruction. It is not there in the rule or in the section. You feel that, no, no, it is something which we have to follow diligently, then you can go by cash. Or if you don't have ITC, then there is no possibility for you to pay it through ITC. You have to pay only by cash. And further, the GSTR 2A, which I discussed earlier, that you have an option to upload it without certification, the uh, GSTR 2A reconciliation that happens in table 8, because table 8 has got a lacuna, the problem, 2017-18, March 2018 invoice uploaded by the supplier, I will receive it in April and I would have taken an ITC in April only. Now I cannot see March 2018, 2018 invoice in this HC of what the department has, IETA rather, the department has allowed me to download, I am not able to see it there. Does it mean my credit will become ineligible? I don't think so, which is why if you are diligently doing this matching, Better to prepare a uh, Excel sheet, uh, take a printout or take a convert it into PDF and upload it with 9C if you feel that it is perfectly matching. And then coming to the last part of our discussion in GSTR 9C critical area, I would say this is the most critical area, especially from an ITC perspective. Look at your uh, table 12. In table 12, uh, 12B and 12C have been made optional. So though the department has made it optional, I would re request you not to consider it as optional. Take it very seriously because this is where we are seeing a lot of write-offs happening in the books of accounts or write-backs happening in the books of accounts. I will tell examples for both scenarios. When we did an electronic credit ledger vis-a-vis -vis books reconciliation for a client, what we found was in 3B the credit has been availed 36 lakhs in excess compared to what is there in books. In books it is not even there. But credit has been availed. When we went by the electronic, uh, the ITC register that they have maintained, which we have created for them from 3B, we verified all the documents, the credit is eligible. Then we were wondering what is the problem. The problem was whenever the customs duty is being paid, they book it as an expense. But subsequently, the accountant is supposed to pass an entry 
crediting the expense, debiting ITC every month. But the old accountant went in October. He didn't give the handover to the new accountant or he gave this new accountant forgot for the next six months, October to March, this accountant has not passed that entry, which means in income tax, they have claimed the full amount as expense, customs duty. But in the eyes of GST, they have claimed it as ITC. So we are in a different situation now. Book is lesser, ITC as per GST is more. Either I have to reverse 3B, but I told them, your ITC is eligible, why reverse? So now what has to be corrected is books of accounts. So their statutory auditor was informed and he has taken it as a miscellaneous income in the next year. In the next year, p and they have accounted as a miscellaneous income and they have paid income tax on it. One situation. Second situation, books contains 18.3 18 crores. The electronic register contains only 14 crores. And when we reconcile, we reconcile that 14 crores is only right. Then what about this four crores difference? It has to be written off. Because they cannot carry it forward, no? In their books, they can carry, that is their prerogative. But if they are carrying it forward in the books, what good that ITC is? It is not actually an ITC. Your electronic credit ledger shows something and that shows something. How can you carry it forward? So hence, please pay attention to this ITC availed. And here in table 12, we are not reconciling the closing balance. Again, I want to stress on that point. It is only asking for the ITC availed during the period. ITC availed during the period and that split between what is for the previous year availed now and for this year availed subsequently, adjust it and check with GSTR 9. What is ITC availed in your 3B? That is how they want us to do this. This is to be done plus without telling here in the reconciliation, they have not asked us, but we have to do an electronic credit ledger reconciliation. That is where you will get to know whether anything has to be written off or anything has to be written back. Hence, please take this table 12 very seriously. It is only one part what they ask. What is more is like the root of a tree. It is not meeting the eye, the electronic credit ledger reconciliation, but we have to do that. The next one is the certification that which we are giving. Two types of certifications are there. On one part, that is where I am the statutory auditor and I am also the GST auditor. That part has to be filled up part one of part B. Or we have to fill up the second part, that is when I am only a GST auditor, I am not the statutory auditor, we have to fill up the second part of part B. In that, what we are giving as an assurance is, I have verified the documents, records, or I approve, or I am attesting that the documents and records for the assessee are existing. So, I want to take the last five or 10 minutes of this presentation only to uh, discuss about what are the documents and records that should be there as per GST. The documents that must be there as per GST, tax invoice we know, bill of supply we know, debit note, credit note we know. All these are basic documents, but there is another, or there are another set of documents which a person has to maintain, which generally we don't consider. A revised invoice. What is a revised invoice? It is not an invoice to revise an invoice. It is actually an invoice which has to be given by a person who has become liable to get registered and got registered, but for the period from which he was becoming liable to register till the date he got registered, he has to pay GST. For example, 25th September 2018, I have become liable, but I got registered only on 13th October 2018. But my registration certificate will say you have become liable to register from 25th September. So your registration certificate is effective 25th of September. So from 25th September to 13th October, you are liable to pay GST. What document will arise? I would have already given invoices. You are supposed to raise a self, you are supposed to raise a revised invoice. And that revised invoice has to be given within one year. Sorry, one month from the date of you becoming liable. So this is where you are going to give a revised invoice. This is one of the documents which generally doesn't meet the eye, which is there. And then bill of supply, we already are aware. The other document that one has to be aware is whenever we are receiving an advance, we are supposed to give a receipt also. All the people who are uh, dealing in goods, they would have forgotten this because see, whenever we are uh, aware that on advances taken for goods, why should I pay? There is no need for paying GST. Then why should I raise the receipt voucher? Agreed. But the payment of tax on advances for goods is only dispensed with. Raising of a receipt voucher as a record is not dispensed with. So whenever we receive an advance, whether it is goods or service, we are supposed to raise a receipt voucher mandatory. And that advance is being given back without being converted into an invoice, that time we are supposed to raise a refund voucher. And through this refund voucher only, we will be able to claim back the tax paid on the advance. Suppose if it is a service provider. Let's say I am a marriage hall. I have taken an advance. I have paid GST on that, on the advance. Then what is the document which is making me liable to pay GST? Is it uh, the tax invoice or is it an advance voucher? It is an advance voucher. And when I am returning it, the person is saying, sir, the marriage cannot happen. Please give me the money back. When you give the money back, you are supposed to raise a refund voucher. 
that refund voucher which you are raising reducing the liability has to be supported by this refund voucher and the refund voucher will always have a connection with the receipt voucher like a debit note or a credit note is always an underlying document to an invoice a refund voucher and a gst is always an underlying document to a receipt voucher commonly not seen documents but which should be maintained by the assessor and then self invoice section 31 sub section 3 class f which i told earlier when you are procuring from an unregistered person and you are liable to pay gst under reverse charge this has to be raised and if you are making advance payment to a reverse charge person maybe your gta is asking you for advance you are making payment to him you are supposed to raise a payment voucher and then evable reconciliation something which in the state of karnataka i would say is critical because though for rest of india it got introduced from 1st of april 2018 only for karnataka i think the evable reconciliation with the e sukam of the s2l system was already there there can be a possibility that department can come back to us saying you have raised so much of invoices but why not so much of evables or vice versa so much of evables why not so much of invoices hence an evable reconciliation would not hurt but whether you will be able to get the accordingly the commercials with the, the assessee or something which you uh, you manage to speak to the assessee and get a confirmation but evable reconciliation can substantially avoid litigations in future avoid tax evasions also and then delivery chalan reconciliation when evable reconciliation is done delivery chalan should also be looked at because when delivery chalan based movement is done we are not actually paying gst to the department but there is a possibility that if the delivery chalan is made for a supply if the delivery chalan is made for a supply then we are liable to pay gst you know did they pay it subsequently that has to be found out hence the delivery chalan reconciliation can also be a mandatory thing that we may have to perform if the assessee is going to be a majorly moving person that is goods movement person these are the documents in addition to the main documents that we discussed uh, are something which we can go through maybe even do a test check or a sample check to check whether these are in compliance with the gst law and uh, what are the records that one has to maintain rather what the, the documents one has to maintain where is the assessee supposed to report it there is a place in gstr 1 table 13 this is where the assessee is supposed to report but unfortunately this table is not a mandatory table so people will just go there and give one invoice series number starting ending number of invoices and that's it they will skip this table totally they will not even be bothered about it but we will have to bother about it because had the assessee given all the documents here then these are the documents that we should have audited but if he had not given at least we should have taken a cut off and said this is these are the documents that have been used by the assessee so this is what is my audit procedure that you can define and finally what are all the records that an assessee should maintain this i have taken by reading the section 36 with rule 56 of the cgst where 12 types of records or 13 types of records are emerging if you are a manufacturer production records will have to be maintained if you are a service provider service supplied register shall have to be maintained then inward supply purchase register in other words goods or services shall have to be maintained outward supply sales register shall have to be maintained stock records must be maintained there is no specific format but these are the records the officer can ask in whichever format you are maintaining you can give it to them but these records will have to be maintained and the input tax credit itc availed register shall have to be maintained so some of the places purchase register and itc register can be combined it is not a problem as long as you are able to give the data same way output tax liability register here also output tax and sales register can be combined there is no issue but the record has to be maintained import of goods or services separate register export of goods or services separate provision should be there sir i am integrating it in the purchase register itself i am integrating in the sales register itself no problem but the record has to be maintained and reverse charge inward supplies on which i am liable to pay gst in the reverse charge separate record will have to be maintained and outward supplies by me on which the other party is liable to pay under reverse charge that should also be maintained by me so suppose i am a gt i am paying on my uh, taxes uh, i am paying on forward charge also plus i am paying on reverse charge i mean my customers are paying under reverse charge to what extent my customers are liable to pay under reverse charge that also i should maintain this i can again integrate with my sales register this is what these people will report in their gstr1 as whether tax is payable under reverse charge yes they will mention it as yes that register will have to be maintained and finally advance received and advance paid registers shall have to be maintained both from an inward supply perspective as well as an outward supply perspective these are in a nutshell the records that we need to verify or we are certifying that we have verified hence the data has to be obtained then only we can say that yes this is in order so now what i can do is i, I will formally conclude that yes my 
for the presentation on GSTR 9 and 9C, the nuances and the points that one has to take care for filing for 18, 19, I have completed. And I am ready to take any questions from your end. I will stop my presentation and start seeing the Q&A box. Okay. Invoices shown in shown as B two C in GSTR one in, of 1920. Now the client is requesting for changing the invoice B two C to B two B. If the same is amended in GSTR one of September 20, does this affect the turnover of 2021? If you amend it, it will certainly affect the turnover of 2021. But doesn't matter. You are going to reduce current month B two C and increase B two B. So net liability impact will not be there. You can do it because two A reconciliation has become mandatory for him. It has to be done. Professional services rendered by a doctor to a company. Who is also a director of the company, RCM is applicable. That is what I explained. You know, director being a doctor, it is a service which is exempted. So, where there is a question of reverse charge, it is a service. I, I don't deny that, but it is exempted. I don't see a reverse charge happening there. Tax liability under RCM pertaining to 1718, discharge in the month of 2020. Can ITC be avoided? Absolutely. I was expecting this question to come. So, ITC uh, for 1718 or 1819, I am paying the RCM only today. Can I avail ITC? I am of the view that yes, you can avail ITC, but you have to pay that RCM with interest because the time of supply for that RCM has already occurred in that respective financial year, 1718 or 1819. You are availing ITC now by making the payment of tax. Sir, where is it said that I can avail? It is not said anywhere, but you have to infer it. Uh, rule 36 sub rule 1, in that clause B, which I showed as five documents that are required, the second document that you would have seen there is a self invoice. Based upon a self invoice, you can avail ITC. If your other party is unregistered and you are paying it at a reverse charge, it is based upon the self invoice. So the self invoice, you can avail the ITC, but what you are doing is since you have made a delayed payment, you are paying interest to the department. When you are compensating for the delay to the department, why penalize you one more time by not availing ITC? You are still entitled to avail ITC is my view. You pay it in 2020, you can. A service invoice is made to the head office at Karnataka is made to the head office at Karnataka. The service is used in the Tamil Nadu branch and the expense is entered there. Can the input be claimed in Karnataka just because GST mentioned is of Karnataka? Okay. When Who is the recipient of service? If the recipient of service is a person who is, there, there are, uh, the recipient of service has got four different uh, situations. The definition says there, as per that, who is directly, who is placing the order and who is receiving the service. No, no, or if it is more than one location which is getting benefited, then which is the one more directly connected with receiving it. So in this case, I would say, though the Tamil Nadu branch is the one who is receiving, Karnataka branch has received the invoice, Karnataka is entitled to take ITC. But here the question that department can raise is, now that Karnataka has paid for it, is Karnataka going to do a cross charge to Tamil Nadu? That is the question that department can raise, which again, in the right of rule 28, we can give an answer. Reconciliation of 2A. There are different values in 88 and 2A. I don't know what is to be reconciled. And that is what I told you, sir. Please uh, forget about uh, what is there coming in 8A. Whichever way in which you can download the 2A for that respective period, take it. And that is reconciled. And reconciled numbers, please make it as a PDF. Your reconciliation in a summary as well as the attachments to it. And upload it along with 9C. For that, child account certification is not required. Do it in 9C. When the advance cannot be identified if received for rendering exempt service or taxable service, how the GST is to be calculated on advance and how to report in 9. Example advances for large rooms having different rates. Perfect. Uh, in these cases, you can go by a simple logic. Section 2, subsection 31, consideration definition. It says whenever you are taking a deposit, which is what I would say in this case, you are taking a deposit. Only when it is offset, it is considered to be a consideration. So you can go according to that and pay GST only at that time. But there is a high possibility or a risk in this case that department will come back and say you knew it at first point itself. So that can arise. But here, um, again, you are talking about large services. I would say they will book revenue on a daily basis. When you are booking revenue on a daily basis, your software, so maximum delay can be one day delay can happen for an advance. I don't think it can happen more than that. So hence the time of supply, accordingly you can cut off on the 31st and do it. 
ITC not claimed in returns and same got lapsed. Okay. Which column of GST are 9? The lapsed ITC is to be shown. If shown in 80, then 9C, there will be a difference. Sir, that is what I am suggesting. Table 8, you please ignore. ITC lapsed to, is what? You are comparing with 2A and saying lapsed. Correct? I am not even worried about the 2A comparison in table 8. I want to upload it as a separate reconciliation. Now, if you have availed ITC for 100 invoices, you are answerable only for 100. Not for the 200 which has been uploaded against your name in 2A. The 200 uploaded against your name, you have not availed ITC. So why do a reconciliation and talk about lapsed credit and all? You be answerable only for the 100. That being the case, so you upload only for this 100 the reconciliation in the format that which you like in GSTR 9C. So don't take the pain of finding out what is lapsed or not. If you have not availed, it is anyway lapsed. Output liability paid in excess in 1819 and the same amount is reduced in the liability of April 2019. How to present? You can present it in table 9 of GSTR 9C. The excess liability paid, you can qualify it in the reason. For example, in table 9 of GSTR 9, liability will be there. Table 9 of GSTR 9, the tax payable field will be there, which you can edit. There you show the lesser amount. But what is paid will be showing as a higher amount. So there will be a difference in your table 9 of GSTR 9C, which contains the payment rate wise details. There, there will be a difference. That difference you please qualify as the amount paid in excess for the financial year 1819, but which has been offset in 1920. So, assessee need not apply for a refund. But in this situation, if the assessee has not done the offset of the excess payment in the next month, for how does he have the right to do the offset? Circular number 26 of 2017 gives the power. December 2017, circular number 26 says that this month you paid excess, next month you can offset it, is what department has told. So he has got the right to offset it in April 2019. So in April 2019, the GSTR 9 and 9C will look the opposite side. That is liability will be more, paid will be less in GSTR 9, table 9. In 9C, there will be a positive difference. That is, what is payable is more, what is paid is less. But there also you can say, there is no need to pay further because last year itself, this amount has been paid in excess. So this reconciliation will have to be understood with both the years, GSTR 9 and 9C can be accommodated. Excess ITC not reversed in any returns. The same is to be reversed in 9. Yes. Under which column it is to be reversed? Table 7. That is where it has to be reversed. Okay. That is all the questions that, uh, that are there in front of me. Yes. There is one more question. Ah, there is one more question. No, sir. Lapsed means with the books and 3B, it got lapsed. I am not able to understand. You are saying that in books I have availed, in 3B I have not availed. If that is the case, you have to reverse the credit availed in books only, no? Because you have not taken it in 3B. What you have taken in 3B should only be matched with 2A. What is there in the books need not be matched with the 2A. Okay. One more question I saw. Yeah. Client is engaged in export of service and claims refund. In case of prepaid expenses, the GST officer insists the client to claim ITC month-wise proportionately. Sir, there is no such provision to ask people to claim it month-wise, sir. Uh, there is no provision, there is no legal uh, backing for that. Because we discussed this in section 13 also, time of supply. Where it says, moment you raise an invoice, at that time the invoice is raised, the service is considered to be completed. Hence, you become entitled to take ITC. That is why they have given that completion also there. So, you can avail it fully, you don't have to avail it proportionately. Imagine. If it is going to extend beyond September of the following financial year, January you have got a prepaid expenses invoice, meaning an invoice for AMC. You are availing it for every month. After September, you cannot even avail, no? Because January invoice following September, you cannot avail after that. So don't do this. It is not right in law. There is one more question in chat, sir. In chat, huh? Can ITC on reverse charge be claimed in the same month in which? Absolutely, yes. You can claim it in the same month for the simple reason. The Again, Rule 36, Sub Rule 1, Clause B, it says self-invoice. You can avail ITC subject to payment of tax. It doesn't say after payment of tax. If it said the after payment of tax, then you can take only after payment. Still, after payment is I have paid the reverse charge in cash. Then you can avail ITC. There is no problem. Avail the ITC in the same month. Sir, we are not availing in the same month. Is that a big problem? Absolutely not. You are anyway availing it in the next month, no? There is only a delay of one month.
good i hope there are no more questions thanks a lot thanks a lot for being patient audience uh, as i discussed as i said at the start of the session um, we are very confident that that will be an extension i do not know for how long uh, hope that uh, you will be able to complete uh, the work by then even if you are not able to complete don't worry late fees all department may at a later point of time so be very confident and find the returns complying with the provisions rather than complying with the deadlines thank you see you all some other time thank you uh, thank you sir for sharing uh, us with uh, uh, insight into the gstr 9 and gstr 9c we had a wonderful session uh, now i request uh, uh, secretary of mysore branch uh, raghuvir sir uh, with a word of water thanks sir thank you sir sir i have, first of all i would like to thank uh, kishore tandale dr kishore tandale irs assistant commissioner of uh, central tax udp for coming and uh, giving his uh, address to the gathering here thank you sir and i would also like to thank uh, the speaker of the day uh, shankar narayan sir uh, for addressing us and uh, giving his insights and valuable inputs for completing this gst 9 and 9c uh, and he has also given us the confidence that uh, there will be extension and even though there is no extension he has told uh, he has suggested and advised us to not to meet the deadlines but to comply with the law thank you sir and thank you for all your uh, valuable inputs on various aspects of 9c like uh, how to handle in case of multi gst and uh, scenarios sale of assets and branch transfer credit notes uh, and uh, <clears throat> rcm gst and you have covered almost all the gamut uh, which comes under 9 and 9c uh, we once again thank you for uh, giving your valuable time and uh, addressing the members of both udupi branch and mysore branch sir and i also thank all the participants who have come here to this uh, session and who have actively participated by asking uh, very relevant and important questions so thank you one and all for coming to this session uh thank you sir thank you thank you everyone we will See. end the session now